Hey gang, this is Phil Moore, just letting you know that if you enjoy our podcast, quite frankly, a Howard Stern podcast, and you'd like to donate some money for the upkeep, uh, or you want to request certain clips, please donate to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash jimfix. That's J-I-M-F-I-X-X. You can donate as much as you want for as long as you want. There's absolutely no obligation. Do you believe I really care? I don't think you care at all. I care no. a lot. <laughs> I don't. I mean, seriously. You, do you, I don't know myself what I want to but do. But I mean, do you think I, when you say you'll give us notice, do you think like a week is good? I tell like, I'll months. give you my notice now. Just <laughs> if you find a job, fine. And then uh, if, if I stay here, then I'll get the it. The last person you told that to went to the Tonight Show. Uh. <laughs> do your children get upset by that? I have a 14-year-old son. What do you think he thinks about right now? He's but but he's probably upsetting that his mother's ass is in the bedroom. That if the kids if the kids yeah, came over, I think you're just being absolutely Jewish. Why is that Jewish? That you be go protective. No, I've had this discussion with you people sound like who are a not nagging Jewish. Mother. Wait a second. Yeah, but this is Eleanor, not. Eleanor, should you have that picture in your room? Your fourteen-year-old son yes, could look I'm at that. Yes, I'm asking you. Is that damaging to a child to see his? My mother. children are very well balanced. I don't see them. There. I once saw my mother come out of the shower. It traumatized me. Yeah, I can imagine. She, she looks had, like you. She had. So <laughs> oh. oh, sorry. I had that. Just that just slipped out. Jewish, so looks like you. I can't get, now I see why these guys leave. I know, I understand. I'm exhausted from it all. I understand the point you're making. I'm I exhausted do. from last night. I'm exhausted from this morning. I'm exhausted from general. You didn't even really go out last night. I did. It was a lot. It was just, it, you know, I, I got a wife. She's trying to. You were out for 45 minutes. I was out for 45 minutes and she's like shell shocked from me. I drained the life out of everyone. Oh my God. It's enough. What is the big deal? You are so upset. I don't want to be part of any Hollywood establishment. I don't want to meet Hollywood people. I don't want to have anything to do with them. I had a My wife wants to go to these parties and stuff. I don't, I'm not interested. Because I'm, I, I'm, I, I drive into Manhattan every day and I listen to you, okay? And if you cut out the bitching, it probably would be about an hour of you. <laughs> You're right. Do you want to know something? Okay. Which, you know, I wish you wouldn't write a book, honestly. Oh, stop. Uh, I really do. <laughs> I mean, I'm not really, I mean, it doesn't do me much good. It doesn't do you much She's good. talking about donating most of the, pro or some of the profits to charity. I mean, what the fuck would you do that for? Uh, I, uh Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Quite Frankly, a Howard Stern podcast. I'm your host, Jim Fix, a.k.a. Fillmore, a.k.a. Fillmore Fingers. And with me, of course, is my co-host with the most, Sam. Hi. And um, for this particular episode, we've got one of our forum, not forum, sorry, Facebook group members, Bob D., who uh, I got in touch with after he posted a comment ages ago about a photo, I think, or some, might have been the Ablo, the, actually the first episode we ever did. And you got logged on and uh, joined the group. And then you mentioned just out of turn, you just said, uh, I'm fascinated with NPD. And then I got in touch with you and tried to find out a little more about what your, what your qualifications are to be on the podcast, basically. And so mm -hmm. would you like to talk a little bit about what your focus is and what your, your, your credentials for <laughs> discussing this, basically? Yeah, I guess if there was uh, credentials, um, they're, not, they're not very impressive uh, on paper, but I, I graduated with a degree uh, in psychology, and I planned to go and get a master's and, and continue, but uh, a job offer came up that I couldn't really turn down. So I sort of continued my passion of studying psychology and then kind of drifting towards the, the more pop aspects where, where you get into psychopaths and sociopaths and... Um, from there, just learning more of the the subpersonality disorders that are pretty common amongst them, and, and narcissistic personality disorder is fairly common amongst criminals. So it's something that I've been studying and fascinated with for several years now. Well, Wiggy is a thief, so he does count as a criminal on some level. Um, but uh, <laughs> you were how long? How long would, had you been listening to Stern? Just 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 give people a little idea of how how your knowledge of his show, basically. So, yes, yeah, so I, I watched the E! Show when I was a kid, um, when I was probably 13. And then um, I had Sirius in my car for, for a couple years. And then 
really, I started really revisiting and going through everything when I got a work from home job about seven years ago. And I'm mm-hmm. pretty much hurt. I've pretty much heard everything from the serious days and, you know, a lot from before that. So I've heard mm-hmm. a lot of it. Mm-hmm. So what was it about the Ablo uh, episode, especially? I mean, we're going to go into it, but uh, mm-hmm. was there something that what was it that jumped out at you, even though you'd heard that segment, I'm sure, many times before? Mm-hmm. Was it something we said that got you to, spurred you to say, well, Jesus, these guys are, they're Take barking your up the right boots tree? Off. <laughs> yeah, well, Dirty in the carpet. I don't give a shit. <laughs> that, that actually was the first thing that was a red flag for me was the boots. Um and I, I had heard it, someone had uploaded it a, a little while ago, and I listened to it then, and I, I, when I heard it then, I, that's, that's when I was, my antennas were fully up, and yeah. uh, when you guys broke it down again, and I heard it again, because I hadn't revisited it in a while, oh, okay. and uh, there were so many things, I mean, that whole thing is, is really a, just an exercise in narcissistic personality disorder. Mm-hmm. That's interesting that you say that, so if you were to put that as like um a case study how -hmm. would you say that that's an example of narcissistic personality disorder like that situation i I really i wouldn't know where to begin because there's so much there i mean even in the beginning stages where he's setting up the illusion that you know the the false self he's setting up this whole thing with everybody in the room that hey, I'm in a perfect marriage. We don't need to be doing this. That's the mm-hmm. narrative. Everybody stick with it. I mean, mm-hmm. that that section alone, you could break down and show how people are, are utilizing their, their uh, power dynamic in that given situation to reinforce this illusion and say, don't go off track with this. Um, I, I was, I was shocked that he even did it to be honest with you. Cause it, it, was, a, it was a real glimpse into their life. Um, so the talking about the, the Ablo clips, the two Ablo, uh, parts that we did. And unfortunately it didn't all focus on Beth and Howard. I kind mm-hmm. of was disappointed when it started going into Artie. However, it did illustrate a little more like the bro fight, which became a big centerpiece of that as well. Benjamin and I talked about this as most of the uh, listeners will know Benjamin's uh, like a a, tr- uh, a reservoir of stern material, and um, he he believes that it, Howard intentionally wanted it this way. This is it, it was you know he's always more comfortable in the studio talking truth. If you're going if you're going to hear any aspect of the truth, it's in the studio where he feels safest. Right. But he the same way that years later when he had a problem with that one photo that Beth tweeted with her and Jared the mom caves host and he mm-hmm. got king of all blacks to act as a proxy and bring it up not him because he doesn't want to be ever responsible and that's one of the key components of NPD you're not yes. taking responsibility so why don't we first go through that list um Bob that you wanted to discuss um the the, the just the, the list of things and then we'll try to get through as many as we can in this segment um, yeah, you know, so so when you're talking about personality disorders and you're talking about, in this case, uh, what's called cluster B personalities, um, so some other things under that would be um, uh, antisocial personality, borderline, histrionic. It's it's like being n- diagnosed with, not not exactly like autism, but the way that you have to think about it as as sort of being a diagnosis in that vein is that it permeates all aspects of the person's life. So it's not mm-hmm. like you have narcissistic personality when it comes to your relationship, but not when it comes to work and not when it comes to having your kids, but you do have it when it comes to money. It, it, it affects every aspect of the person's life. So I think it's a little difficult for for us to really wrap our heads around it because he appears to be normal in a lot of ways where someone who would you say like autism, you know how there's spectrums of autism. Yeah. Would you say that there's spectrums of narcissistic personality disorder? Without, without question. And see, everybody has a certain level of narcissism. Like if you recall when they actually did the test uh, with the whole staff, they Mm -hmm. told 
You know, everybody has it to a certain degree. So that's another reason why you have to appreciate that this is a very profound thing with Howard and not something where he's just being a piece of shit here and an asshole there. This is who he is. Because we all like, you know, we we all have aspects where we like attention or we're self-absorbed or, you know. But with these people, like even when you were talking just now about responsibility, when when we say that they don't want to have responsibility for something, we're talking about a very profound need to not have responsibility, like on Mm -hmm. a level that it's debilitating. So no one likes responsibility. Nobody, you know, like nobody likes to get up and clean and do things like that. But Mm -hmm. with these people, it's not an option. They can't do that. You know, like it's it's a big deal. So. So on the spectrum that you perceive to have him on with NPD, Mm -hmm. what would you say are his characteristics defined on that spectrum? Okay, so. When you're talking about narcissistic personality um, disorder, there's there's a it's a grouping. It's a cluster of um, behaviors and they on a scale of how, you know, if you look back on that test, they were looking at how exploitative, how exploitative are you, you know, how entitled are you? But sort of the the things that you'll see in anybody that has narcissistic personality disorder you'll always see very high levels of self-absorption you'll always see um a pronounced amount of passive aggression within their interpersonal relationships you mm-hmm. always see a lack of empathy you always see victimization and you always see entitlement So the thing in Howard's case, because a lot of people, when they think of, let's say, uh, classic narcissistic personality, you think of what's called overt narcissistic personality. And that has more people that are extroverted tend to have that form. That's when people are very grandiose. It's sort of Mm -hmm. who he is on the mic. Mm -hmm. Um, They're very grandiose. They're very braggadocious. They're very, you know, they'll make stuff up and um they'll say i know this musician i know that musician and Mm -hmm. you usually recognize someone with overt narcissistic personality very quickly you know those are people that you walk away you're like that guy was a total asshole right so um with people what howard has is a more introverted form called covert narcissistic personality disorder and that's where people are very um they have a very big victim complex. So instead of being braggadocious and sort of over the top, they're actually mm-hmm. kind of the opposite. They've called it vulnerable narcissism, shy narcissism. Um, so they're sort of more introverted and they're a constant victim. That's a that's a big theme in their lives is is a victim mentality. Well, what more things, you wanted to say? Yeah, one of the things I wanted to bring up was uh, for years he's he's talked about basically people rip me off jay leno ripped me off and so and so but like the grease man and all these people but in, in actual fact when we look through and we hear the audio he ripped most of these other people off and in fact in the paul t uh, paul colt d goldford book um i want to read a little section of this about two guys that cl- basically both claimed according to the book that he indeed acknowledged them as influences but then later on flipped on them and completely turned them into made them out to be ripoff artists. So one of them was, um, I think Bob Grant. So, oh, okay, it, okay. So among Grant's listeners in the, uh, early days on WMCA, <laughs> I keep, I'm looking at it saying YMCA, but it's WMCA, um, was a young Howard. Grant recalled being approached at a public appearance by Ben Stern, who introduced Howard and said that his son wanted to go into radio. I looked at this big gawky kid and I said to him, just be yourself. Grant remembered now in, uh, when, uh, Stern was on Larry King in 1985 and apparently he's, uh, King asked him what broadcast personalities here or any where do you like Howard said I've always admired Bob Grant who's a local talk show host Um, any uh, anybody else in the country you like he said I'll be honest with you I just don't it says however as Howard became increasingly popular he altered his assessment of Grant at least in public boasting to an interviewer about his own impact on New York radio he said the whole nature of the broadcast dial has changed I hear Bob Grant talking about women and talking about his sponsors and talking about this and that I mean this guy he learned at my feet and um, Bob says um, no one was more understanding about the about face than Grant himself. I think it's all a part of his act, he said in 1995. I find it amusing, even though a lot of people no doubt believe what he says. 
Um, Howard was just right for the times. The country degenerated at the right time for him. Another guy was Alex Bennett, and I won't read it just now, but, well, actually, I may as well, because while we're in it. uh, 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 Yeah, go ahead, Sam. That's actually a profound thing. The country degenerated at the perfect time for him. Mm -hmm. That's a really great way of saying it. We always try to sum up how it was, you know, the perfect time, how everything just happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that statement. So in this case, so there was uh, Alex, Alex Bennett was a, um, another guy, um, early on, it says in much the same way that Howard regarded Grant, he remembered Bennett respectfully at first, then downplayed his influence. Um, uh, as Bennett recalled moments before their on-air exchange, uh, after Howard joined WNBC in the mid eighties, um, Howard said to me, I want you to, I want to interview you because I used to listen to you when I was growing up and you were my inspiration. Later, Howard runs around and starts saying to everybody, hey, everybody's ripping me off. Alex Bennett rips me off. Bennett returned fire during a visit to WMCA in 1989. Bennett described his former fan as that coward, that thief, that lowlife. He's afraid to look at me in the face. This little son of a bitch goes around the air saying how everybody's stealing from poor little Howard. Hey, Howard, you stole from me, okay? So there's no shortage of examples over the years we found of bits that have been pilfered from other places. And the nar- a narcissist, if he has, and at that point he would have been just as full-blown narcissist then as he was later on, maybe maybe mm-hmm. just less so, um, he would not allow himself to a- admit that he ripped off of people. A narcissist couldn't, yes? Yeah, and that's the other aspect of it being covert. You know, that's a very key term there because the way these people operate is very covert. They're very cowardly people so what you've seen with howard is when he does damage it's behind the scenes and when he steals from people it's behind the scenes when he when he put the gag order on opie and anthony he never came out and said hey i shut those fucking guys up no he kind of denied it and people came on and he's like yeah i had them you know it's they they're they're very cowardly people they're they're (laughs) very like they're they're scared of everything Mm -hmm. um and (laughs) <laughs> I have some clips to play just out, of, just on a, you know, on a whim for that. First of all, this first clip is called "Allison Calls Him Passive Aggressive" because we're really start from the try to start from as early on as go forward. It's happened before. It's happened before. And then I. Uh... I appreciate what you have, and you know what? If you want to throw it all away, free me, and then I'll be free to date. You want to you date? Find somebody who really appreciates this. That's right. I'll be watching just... TV today, else. No, you you have to throw me out of the house. <laughs> That's right. He, you know, the girls have to attack him, and you have to throw him out. I wonder something though. If we break up, <laughs> Allison, if we break up, would we still be friends? I don't think so. That was June nineteenth, nineteen ninety-seven. So mm-hmm. the movie had already come out, and they were in the middle of marital hell. <laughs> they were well well into marital hell, and mm-hmm. probably probably even getting close to being separated officially at that time. Um, so, Sam, you wanted to say? I, when you sent me a couple of clips, Bob, this reminded me of one of the things you sent when this is a little bit of the mask falling. He, he's punishing Allison right now mm-hmm. because she's not needing him. Uh, he needs you to be addicted to the attention and the adulation. And once... They stop being the people who are victims of this. They said Mm -hmm. they start to criticize you and Mm -hmm. mock what's important and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this clip I felt like was exactly like Allison should have been in this documentary almost. I could have pictured this clip and her amongst others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, NPD victims. The, the clip we're discussing, everybody, is called uh, narcissist. It's a. It's um, let's see if I got it here. Uh, Sorry, narcissistic abuse and unspoken reality, and it's a 17-minute clip that Bob uh, forwarded to us and was fascinating. I I watched it twice actually, and we're going to play some clips from it. Just a few clips. The in that very clip that I just played, though, Bob, you hear it from him mm-hmm. from his mouth. You have to. You have to kick me out. I'm not going to take responsibility for ending this marriage. You got to do it. Yeah. So if I could say a few things about that clip, and these are a little bit more nuanced um, as you start to understand the disorder more. A few things I've noticed anecdotally is that when these people get out of relationships, their spouse or girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever, they tend to move on very fast to Mm -hmm. where they'll have a new person 
move, you know, the, the spouse will have a new boyfriend or new husband very quickly because I think that they've already sort of to, to detach from the person a long time before the, the split actually happens. And covert narcissists very rarely leave. Um, they'll, they'll continue to stay in a, in a scenario until they're absolutely kicked out mm -hmm. or, or the, or the person completely withdraws. And, um, yeah, that's just, and, and the other thing too, and, and another really important part, cause you had mentioned this uh, to me as well, but when she was just saying, I don't, I don't think we can be friends when I see people separate. And, and either if it's a work relationship, parent relationship, child, whatever, when they finally get away from the narcissist, they usually just want nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no relationship that, cause you're like, I think you guys had said, I can't believe Allison hasn't come out and written anything or said, when people finally get them out of their lives, they, they want nothing to do with them. They don't want, mm -hmm. revenge. they don't want to do it. They just want them gone. Mm -hmm. So something i've seen frequently well when you said when you just said that it's because information is ammunition so if yeah. allison i guess now that i'm thinking of it on the terms that you're presenting right mm -hmm. the information that she has about him if she were to use it at any capacity that's just ammunition for him. Even if she comes out looking amazing to the public, it doesn't matter. Any sort of verbal exchange or anything regarding they're, him, they're he will just constantly. use it as ammunition. That's mm -hmm. what they do. Yeah, they're, they, they're gathering information when you don't think they are. They're watching you when you don't think they are. They mirror you. They'll, they'll, that's, I think, a big aspect in... Um, you know, when we were, when you're talking about the Bob Grant stuff, what reminded me of, um, I, I think it was your guys podcast when they were talking about just how much Howard sounds like Steve Dahl. I don't think a lot of people realize because I grew up in Chicago mm -hmm. and I oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I remember cause I knew Howard cause everybody knew Howard, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't driving at the time. But my stepdad, I remember him driving me to, to hockey practice, and I remember hearing Steve Dahl and just thinking Steve Dahl was ripping Howard off because I knew Howard, and I didn't know Steve Dahl because they sounded so similar with the pauses and the dictation that it was, it was, it was really a complete mirroring of Steve Dahl. So just, that was just a quick side note. Mm -hmm. No, Benja Benjamin, we can thank for that, who did an awesome job at presenting ripping off Steve Dahl. Mm -hmm. He did that. He, yeah. And, thanks, and on our, I mean, it's not just Steve Dahl. It's a lot of DJs over the years. And in fact, yeah. uh, I posted on the Facebook group a, a clip from The Grease Man, which was from one of his comedy albums, actually. It was the Vietnam vet bit, which mm -hmm. Howard used to do endlessly, but way less witty and really just didn't. I've always found in comedy, it, when guys take jokes from other people it's never going to hit no matter how good the joke may be it's never going to be as good as if something you came up with yourself because it's just not you've not internalized it uh mm -hmm. unless you're unless you're doing a like an impression of somebody okay that's fine but either way um one of the uh, earlier clips we were going to play also had to do with we were talking about the, the lack of responsibility so two absentee father clips that we played before and um that the other place and made sort of attempts at analyzing him and by the way everybody i have to give a little disclaimer we're not saying we know anything this is all f just from being fans of the show and giving our pop culture sorry what do you mean Fillmore? he's a present father <laughs> he's a present father <laughs> well he we just we 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 can't know 100 percent if what we're saying is accurate because he only gives you so much the rest yeah. you have to the rest you have to glean but you have to read the fine print when you listen to these clips yeah. and every now and then nuggets come out and you and they hit you. You, you. They're just like earworms. You're going, that's interesting. He never said that before. That sounds, and he didn't stutter. He didn't stammer. It sounds like it could be the truth. So here are two clips from the same bit. I, listen, I would have gone insane. If I had to come you. home, I was with my kids and stuff, but on my terms. <laughs> I love that clip. And the next <laughs> one that continues the same discussion. The, the original discussion was uh, they were goofing on ba Baba Booey about being uh, like the mother to the, his kids and the father because Mary was seemingly not really do lifting a finger and Harry, uh, sorry, Gary was the um, the breadwinner. 
I'm saying is the part, the fact that you were too busy for the kids and other things was not. I wasn't too busy for the kids. I I spend lots of time with my kids. But what I when I needed to. Yeah, I mean that's so what, when you wanted to. Right. And what happened? <laughs> Yeah, well, well, well our relationship as a couple fizzled. Where did that come from? Yeah. It happened from, like, it's just like the same you've gone out with guys that, like, you're the boyfriend before Mr. X, where things for some reason go sour. Yeah, it's because you're not there. <laughs> 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 Imagine hearing that in 2020 when he doesn't speak about his children at all. And uh, at this point, he was, uh, let's see, four or five years divorced or about four years divorced. Listen, so Gilmore, when I need to be a mom, I'll show the fuck up. Otherwise, absolute, absolutely. Hand to um, the face. I mean, what so, the hell? <laughs> well, included included in the private parts book, everybody near the end, they actually enlisted the the services of two psychotherapists uh sheena hankin and richard wessler uh, both of whom had phds in i'm 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 assuming psychology um and uh, based on reading the book which i don't know does this count as um breaking the uh violating the goldwater rule i I have no clue (laughs) okay i'm assuming not if it's in print yeah if it's out for the public it's fine (laughs) I guess so. Uh, and, and, and maybe he, if he gave the, the, if he said it was okay, it was, I guess it was okay. He didn't mind it. Uh, also, he, you know that they're go, they go by lawyers when they publish this stuff. So they went oh, through, yeah. I'm sure, a team of lawyers, editors. There's no way this would get out if it couldn't. So, yeah, I suppose not. I mean, not if they wanted to maintain their own practices. Um, so it says he de- he describes himself as an obsessive compulsive, which is consistent with the following traits. He insists that others submit to his ways using any and all tactics of verbal pers- persuasion, from charm to ingratiation to inducing sympathy to persistent begging and complaining of unfair treatment. When these methods fail, he resorts to bullying tactics, including public humiliation and denigration. All I'm re- all I'm, I'm going through my head there. That last sentence was John DeBella. Also, and if you that's a if whole you, other saga. Here's another interesting part. He describes himself as obsessive compulsive, but the print on obsessive compulsive in the text when you open the book is italicized, meaning that they do not agree with the fact he's obsessive compulsive. Otherwise, it would be in the same font and print as the rest of the text. So they wrote obsessive compulsive in italics. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Not straight print. Yeah, I don't I don't know how (laughs) he's definitely not straight. Sorry, Bob. I don't know how that would how that would show OCD. All I get from that is is narcissism, and people aren't complying with you, so you become bullying. And I don't I don't get OCD from that assessment. So, um, would you like to read the second part, Sam? Can you see it? Yes, I can. Okay, he demonstrates go ahead. excessive devotion to work and productivity to the point of excluding his family and forgoing leisure activities. Thank God you didn't say leisure. Uh, Let me see. Uh, It says in the next part, his mother's obsessive compulsive cleanliness and father's anger problem are, by the way, this is based on his, his, his telling of the tales, uh, are patterns that uh, promote feelings of shame and humiliation in children. Such feelings often trigger rage. One of his most noticeable feelings. Now we were, we, there is a narcissistic rage clip that we're going to play a little later. Mm -hmm. Uh, He, he expresses rage in verbal as well as physical attempts to humiliate others. Let's talk about baloney on the ass and, uh, you know, getting people naked and stuff. These sadistic tendencies are based on his own sense of shame and lack of self-respect. To compensate for his feelings of inadequacy and powerlessness, he makes himself seem powerful so that he can shame and mock others. Bob. So I, I don't I don't buy the first part of that about his mother's OCD or his father's rage mm-hmm. issue at all. Um, yeah, I, I another big thing, you know, and if you remember from that narcissistic um, clip that I sent you, the documentary really the only emotions these people feel is rage and Mm -hmm. envy and hatred is about the only three emotions that they have. They're, they're very angry people Mm -hmm. when they're talking about how angry he is here. I mean, when someone, when someone's primary, um, you know, personality attribute is, is anger uh, that's a huge red flag for someone with NPD. And then also they're, they're very big on humiliation. Mm-hmm. They're very big on exploiting people. 
Um, so again, I mean, and I'm not trying to make this just fit my diagnosis, but I don't, I, I haven't gathered anything that his father had a rage issue or, or anything like that. The, the one clip they have of him yelling at Howard, he's clearly trying to make a technical tape and they were just burning through time. So he yelled mm -hmm. at him. Yeah. I mean, I didn't think that was out of line or anything. He, he yelled at him for uttering a racial slur. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that get, always gets glossed over. Sam, you wanted to say. Well, now that you said that, I'm going to say something else that, but that's almost like he called him to the, he called him to the front of the class for that racial slur, right? And mm -hmm. instead of accepting responsibility for what that meant and how mm -hmm. his father was mad, he chose to take that as his father, how dare he do that and abuse him and that stayed with him. So he used that tape to abuse his father for even being brought to justice. And so the fact that his father even wanted to do that, his verbal rage was what he got back from that. He got to pay him back. He stuck with that and thought, I'm not wrong. You're wrong for ever even calling me out on that. Right. Uh, another aspect, too, that they mention here, um, very frequently with covert narcissistic personalities, they have a lot of sadistic that they, they they enjoy su people suffering. They enjoy making people suffer. And to speak to what you just said about his dad, these people, when they hold grudges, they never let them go. Mm -hmm. I mean, beyond a reasonable time, everybody is holding on to something, some kind of grudge. These are well beyond the normal trajectory of grudges, and they're usually not not even fair to begin with because you can see these these attributes of uh, self-absorption, lack of empathy and entitlement. When you're walking around with that mindset, you can very easily think that people are taking slights at you or someone's treating you unfairly because you're not empathizing with the person why they're doing it. So you're just taking it as an offense to you and they'll hold on to that stuff until until they die most of the time. Well, there's one clip you sent us by Todd Grand or Grande. I'm not sure how he pronounced it. It's Grand with an E at the end. Um, in, in, in the um, uh, in the uh, the video about narcissistic mothers, there was a quote he 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 said. And I'm going to repeat it here. Sa uh, the son doesn't have to do anything wrong, but whatever the slight is in the case of the narcissistic mother, uh, it's held against him forever. And it sounds more like Wiggy. But mm -hmm. your 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 contention when we discussed this privately was, uh, first of all, the contention that he was not molested as a kid. He was not abused physically. Mm -hmm. um, but do Ray, we have that clip where he the, said the, he was molested? The, I'm going to I'm going to play that one because I think it's important that people hear. Yeah. Uh, then hear uh, to me, I was I wasn't convinced by it because it sounded like something he was parroting from somebody else he heard or could have been Ralph. Who knows? And um you would know if you were molested. My opinion, if if you've buried it because of for fear of uh, whatever reason, uncovering that horrible memory, or what is it, recovered memory? I guess they call. Um, you would okay not remember that it happened. You if you did remember it, you'd have to know it was molestation. So you hear for I, yourself, folks, and you let me know, Bob. I don't buy it either. I, it, it, there is trauma. There's always trauma in these people's childhoods but they keep it hidden again mm -hmm. they have a hidden self if that was if that was a source of trauma he would never more than likely he would never actually you know reveal that to his audience or anyone that's what i think too so yeah. we're going to play howard Stern admits to being molested as a child some other weird stuff in the news just real quick i, I was just reading the newspaper i don't want to forget about this stuff and by the way folks this one goes a little while but we're going to play about two minutes two and a half minutes of it so bear with us there's a whole story about mickey mantle's dark secret turns out his dark secret is his uh cousin or somebody was molesting him when he was a kid Ooh, that's pretty so awful mantle's teenage how half do they sister. find out about it now i don't know you know with these books here mantle's teenage half sister and older boy sexually molested mantle when he was a child i think i might have been sexually molested as a child now you're thinking. Oh my God! So he's jealous of Mickey Mantle's molestation because the attention's on him for five seconds. <laughs> that's, that's what it sounds like. Like that's exactly I, what that is. 
I got. I've got to. Uh, I've got to usurp this focus. Bring a memory. Uh, you, uh... Yeah, I uncovered a memory that upsets me. Really? Yeah, that I might have been molested as a child. This sounds. Howard, what... you're not hitting any home runs. They're just hitting <laughs> you in the head. When I hear this, all geez. all I'm thinking is the Ed Bradley. Uh, uh, I, I I don't I don't remember this. I blocked it out. Which, by the way, everybody, we will be doing that 60 minutes walkthrough at one point. It's only 15 minutes, but we'll probably stretch it into three hours. How um, about him, Ed? <laughs> yeah, uh, but I don't even know if you'd call it molestation. I don't know. You see, I'm conf- <laughs> I don't know if you'd call it molestation because he enjoyed it. <laughs> no, Fuse, I think it is molestation. You want to tell me about it? Sure, I'll tell you about it. Okay. There was a uh, a person. I'm not going to tell you the relationship to this person. I don't even want to like. I don't want to dredge it up because that they're much. they're the boogeyman. They're the tooth fairy, Santa Claus, Easter Bunny. I mean, are you frigging kidding me? And Robin, you can go along with this too with your made up molestation from your father. Continue. Yeah. If you've read the book, by the way, have you, did you ever read the Quivers of Life book, uh, Bob? I, I listened to the the audio of it when I think maybe Radio Gunk did a made fun of it, or maybe it was you guys that made fun. We of did it. we did it when we were there, and uh, we took apart the audio book, which was only about maybe thirty three percent of the actual book. And yeah, you so and much Benjamin of it was prepared so well. You guys did great. Yep, Tracy Lynn, Benjamin, and I were the and Mildred McSpanks for a good chunk of it. We were responsible for that that podcast. That was unbelievable. Was that fucking. But I remember uh, he told me to sit on his lap. You have re- alluded to this before. All right. He, so I sat on his lap, and he took his hand and he stuck it on my balls, underneath my balls. This was over my clothing, and he started to push his hand. Under, like, grab my balls and then push into them with his hand, causing me pain. Uh huh. And squeezing them really hard, and I jump off his lap. And this happened once, and I got all freaked out. Right. Is that a molestation? Yes. Okay. That- now, this is my issue, guys. I know in in 2020, you're supposed to believe people who who claim they've been molested, abused, raped, all this stuff, but you're human first, and you're you know, politically correct second. And if something sounds like bullshit to you, you go, most people go with their gut. Knowing what we know about Howard, that only exacerbates the feeling of I'm, we're being taken for a fucking ride here. This clip is from, I think, 2012. And or I, I believe, and I'm not, uh, I, I could, I'm, it could be 2010, but it's definitely post already because you had so much dead air in the clip. Uh, Sam, you wanted to say? Okay. So I'm not a guy, obviously, but, um, If I was sitting on somebody's lap and you guys have these parts, right? When you squeeze somebody's balls for a few seconds, wouldn't you immediately jump up in pain or anguish or some sort of physical response to that? You wouldn't just sit there and think about it. No, it's it's a you you, it's instinctual because it's such pain. I mean, women will never know, but think of some nagging thing at the base of your stomach that just doesn't go away. If you've ever got a shot, I mean, I had a baby that sucked, and you know, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, and uh, you know, he 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 would tell you he did too because just 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 to to compete with your own pain. But um, let's continue this one. I was molested as a child. Yeah, and he wacko who invades your space like that and hurts you of course that's a molestation and the thing that's bugging me now is this memory comes back two people witnessed it and said nothing go ahead sam okay so if your balls were being squeezed when you were a child to the point that he said they were and you didn't jump off that's weird two people witnessed it this doesn't make any sense no way no way and the two people, he's got to be thinking his parents, and he's not naming them. If that if that really did happen, and I can't believe either of them would just say, "Oh, that's acceptable. You can grab his his balls." All right. You know that's why that's part of the reason why I don't buy this. Well, even that's... if ball, even if balls like balls are a vagina or whatever, who then? Just... Right. Substitute whatever okay. private part. Right. Fine. If somebody as a kid was grabbing my crotch like the way he's describing, I would still. No, that that's not right and jump up. I wouldn't be an adult being like, was this right? <laughs> that's right. So if he was, you know, two or something, if he's a toddler, okay, obviously, but you wouldn't recall this, first of all. Most people don't have memories of that young. Uh, uh, it's it's not, not until you get a little older, but. What happens, too, because who knows what to do in these situations? Um, you what know? kind of what kind of child molester overtly molests children in front of adults? 
Um, unless they're in on it as well. I mean, that's that's another reason why I don't buy. Oh, this. so I now just... he's involved in a pedo ring? Don't stroke his ego. <laughs> no, I'm I'm saying I'm saying like if those people saw it and didn't do anything, it, as the way he explains it, the only way it would be okay with them is if they. Well, first of all, if they didn't see it and he thinks they did, that's a different story. But How also, do you again, see I just this, don't. Bob is an MPD, by the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, the way that uh, obviously, like you said, you can't really look at. You never want to deny that something happened to somebody because we, mm-hmm. we don't know. Right. Um, the the only, I guess, the only thing that I I really get from from this clip is that if that did happen. It definitely didn't affect him in a normal way, you know. Like he's trying to, he's trying to have it as like a, I, I don't know, a trauma. But it clearly wasn't that traumatic to him the way that he's talking about it, which I find to be really unusual. Um, if it did actually happen, but that, that's Great all I'm point. really getting from this. Maybe, maybe it was a turn on. Um, the um, okay, the, I'm going to try to go through. There's a few more clips like. Isn't that, that funny, we... Fillmore? It's just like how Robin wasn't affected by her dad's molestation to the point where she could mock it and let other people right. mock it. They so actually that, had a yeah. Ham Hands Bill, Ham Hands Bill. song. Robin. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. The Vaseline. <laughs> I put a Daddy's chunk of Vaseline. <laughs> <laughs> upon the tip of my dick. No, I think I, I I never bought that one for a minute. When I heard it, the minute I heard it and replayed it, I go, no, 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 this is bullshit. And either way, uh, there's another clip I wanted to play. This particular one uh, was the early, and it's an early therapy discussion. Uh, let me just make sure this is the right one. I think okay, it's. I called. <laughs> this is from 1997, uh, October 14th. He brings up Sarno. What are you busy. afraid of? What do you mean, what am I afraid of? I called the guy. Yeah, but this is years now. Man, I don't, I just can't imagine going in and talking to someone and opening up to them. Go try it. You know, yeah. If you can't, you stop. Really? They let you out? Or is it like, yeah, is it like Scientology? It's, it's a locked door. <laughs> Plus, what I can't figure out is like when you're in the waiting room, everyone knows you're mental. No, you got to have a separate waiting room. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, but How do I get I, that? When I used to go... How do I get a separate waiting do. room? You oh, do. God, he's so manic. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> 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 It it actually uh, it goes against something he said in 2003 in a later clip that he's only been in therapy three years. But this is he he went in in round 97. So he talks about this. John Sarno told him he should go see. Uh, this is later in the clip, so I'll play it through. I have a person who has two waiting rooms. Oh really? How about three waiting rooms? <laughs> what? You have another personality to stash in the other one? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, they must be real crazy. What's their problem? Mm. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're probably thinking the same thing about me. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. I, at least I called again. I hope you don't run into anybody you know. That's I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, you go here, too? <laughs> Hello! You're mental, too? See, that's cool. what you just... You hope that you're walking in and you notice them. You go, oh, I'm, this is the wrong office. I was going down the street. Well, I went to like one shrink, you know, but he's on a shrink with Dr. John Sarno. And he's the guy that told me I need to be in therapy five days a week. Right, yeah. But you know what? I was just reading something the other day that said uh, th- psychiatrists and therapists, their uh, income is going down because people... So anyway, I, I don't think there's much more to that, but he, there he's admitting John Sarno. That was... I th- this is well after the Private Parts movie and then the book Miss America, where you start going into how Sarno was explaining to him about... You know, mind, body, blah, 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 and how he was explaining. Also oh, it got rid of my OCD and all this bullshit. Wanted him to talk about being gay, and he yes, didn't explore Yes, that's it. that's right. And I, I have that clip. I'm not going to bring it out today. We have another. We have other time for that because that'll be the sexual aspect or the psychosexual aspects of uh, covert NPD and and narcissism in general. Bob, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Well, the the interesting thing Howard does is because remember, you always have to keep a victim narrative. Um, he always talks about how frequently he goes to therapy, like it's it's showing you this is how damaged I am, this is how much trauma I have, I'm going five days a week, I'm going three. You can go to therapy as much as you want to go to therapy. I mean, a perfectly healthy person can go to therapy every day of the week. They're going to take your money. It's like saying I'm getting a massage five days a week. It doesn't mean that you were in a car accident. You know, if you want to go get a massage five days a week, you can go get a That's massage. That's a great analogy. 
Well, this is the um, the, the, the well, part of the same. Sorry, let me make sure I got the right pages. Um, OK, uh, this is also, again, from the private parts reading that we were going to we were going through uh, his displays of affection are highly restricted. He claims to love his wife, but cites no examples of open affection towards her. Um, toward her. His skin standard description of their sex life consists of either complaints about its infrequency or her lack of interest in mentions of quick encounters in which foreplay that arouses her is deemed burdensome. <laughs> he seems <Hey>! content <laughs> he seems content simply to satisfy with the vibrator with uh, which saves him the time, energy, and effort of love making. And then at the same time, just in I think the a couple of years before they did that um do you remember Sam they did the Hollywood not, what's it called not Hollywood Squares, um the newlywed game. And then he started talking about, I tried to get her, and he talks about it in private parts, I tried to get her to do some anal, but then I asked her, mm -hmm. you know, if she'd put her fingers in my ass. And, and it got to the point where he wanted it so bad that he did it to himself in the shower. In the shower. And yeah. It didn't, yeah, it wasn't that's successful. On one of, that's on one of these pages. Um, yes. Yeah. And, uh, okay, so he, this is, um, okay. He consistently claims to be scrupulously conscious uh, conscientious about either ethical values governing is this subject, but he expresses these by observing the letter of the law rather than its spirit. He voyeuristically examines women as they strip naked for him and comments on the size of their breasts and presence or absence of pubic hair. He'll use any number of questionable ruses, uh, ruses, ruses, as ruses. an excuse, I think so, as an excuse to proceed further and fondle the women. H hence, he adheres to standards of marital fidelity in a narrow technical sense and therefore feels a both above criticism and justified in criticizing less faithful persons. Ironically enough, he fucked around on her. Uh, and I have the clip of him saying it, by the way, everybody would back me up, uh, whom he demeans by way of congratulating himself and assu assuaging his guilt. At the same time, he gratifies his own self-centered sexual urges. It is acceptable to be rubbed all over by sexy women and to caress naked bodies for his own satisfaction. This, he claims, is not infidelity simply because he says it isn't. After all, he doesn't actually penetrate the women. So we're looking at a, like a Bill Clinton type thing, if any of this was even true, um, you know, would define sex, right? Mm. But the next part is more interesting. Stern is also prone to star strong narcissistic tendencies, and that's where this is important. Sam, would you like to read the first one? Sure. He views as unreasonable anyone who disagrees with his strongly self-defined perspectives on life. And these people become the targets of his scorn, including listeners who call in and his show or his wife. That's interesting because, yeah, he does not take criticism well at God, any turn. God. God, no, that's a whole other show we're going to do where people got to him one way or the other, whether it was caller or guest in studio that okay. pissed him off. Bob? Yeah, so so what I was talking about when they have these three jobs in life, it, one of them is to constantly maintain what's called the false self or the false image. And so you 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 could imagine if they've gone into this state where they're creating this image that isn't reality, that isn't, you know, it's it's a protective mechanism where they basically make themselves gods in their mind. You know, gods are perfect. So Really, any kind of criticism to these people is taken as a blow to their false self or, or the um, is made this, up image. Is this false self innate or learned? So it, it's self-created. Um, a lot of what narcissistic personality disorder is sort of it, it, what it is at its core is it's it's an adaptive it's when your your mind kind of goes into an adaptive state after trauma, and it's rooted in abandonment. So the mm. way that they kind of protect their own psyches is they create this grand psyche, because that or this this grand image that isn't true, and it can be programmed. It cannot, you know, a lot of trauma based mind control, even or or a lot of the studies that were done back in the '60s and '70s. When you when you can inflict enough trauma on somebody's mind and they start to go into that adaptive state where they're creating a false self, you can suggest certain things and they will take on those qualities. But it's mostly self-created. So in Howard's mind, I mean, we all know what the false self for him is. It's Well, then where did he receive the trauma that created this in I your want to go into it now but i believe that his source of his trauma was his mother 
um, when his mother went through a phase. I think that his mother has narcissism. And there was a, a phase, I believe he was a teenager. He might have been a bit younger when his mother's sister who raised her died. Mm -hmm. And he went into a state where he even said on that comedians and cars, uh, the Jerry Seinfeld thing where he said, we didn't know if she was going to go upstairs and commit suicide. And that can be pretty traumatic on a kid if they're exposed to that every day, because you have someone who's a, a mother who's completely removed emotionally is not nurturing your, you know, your, your central nervous system is always worried that they're going to commit suicide. So that starts to become hyperactive. So I think his real trauma actually came from his, his mother during that time and, and just in general. Mm -hmm. Well, th there's a clip that I found that I, we can't play because it's roughly an hour and it really is a great discussion. I'll send it to you guys and I may upload it later about Ben Stern calling in and explaining how he he, he didn't have much of a, a, father, a parental, parental guidance in his life. Ben Stern, when he was growing up, it was the depression and this and that. But also he he figured that if he was providing for his children the way the way that he did that's better than what he had growing up because he he grew up with absolutely nothing howard then proceeds to decide he decides well m maybe that's why i <laughs> i thought to my kids i'm being a good enough father by just providing shit i don't have to be responsible for you and uh, go ahead bob well again you know what what i've always noticed with howard and, and when he talks about his father you know he's got the whole narrative that He'd yell at him, but he always seems to redeem his father at some point yes. where, you know, he was a good guy or, you mm -hmm. know, he came out and he told uh, the favors that he did for, I think, his brother-in-law. But he never really seems to do that for his mom. And he's actually gone to a point that he said she, he believes she's more intellectually deficient than him and his father. I mean, those are things that you say about someone that you really deeply dislike. And it doesn't seem like he ever really gives her that redemption that he gives his father. Uh, so this uh, from that aforementioned documentary, folks, I'm going to play a little clip of it. But it's just after Sam says, yep, Sam, go ahead. So I will say for Ben, too, when you were talking about how this is he felt that just providing was enough. I also think of people of the Jewish faith who had family members that survived the Holocaust. I actually watched a lot of documentaries of children of survivors of the Holocaust that immigrated to America and made a way of life here. They were not emotionally taken care of as children because they were, some of them at least, were cold and distant parents because they were PSD survivors with PTSD, no treatment. PTSD. P yeah, sorry, PTSD survivors, no treatment. And they were so consumed with survival mode that mm -hmm. they did not have that emotional mothering or fathering way that we do, or maybe we're familiar with growing up with. So maybe mm -hmm. there is some of that within that family as well. I'm not saying that that's the case, but I have watched some documentaries about that. Not like I'm some, you know, savant in it or anything. Just thought it was a good point. Well, Bob? if I'm not mistaken, his mother's family was in the Holocaust, I believe, yeah. or they had some family members that, that did wind up um, being taken. And I think that that did traumatize his mom quite a bit. And he would talk about how she was always talking about very morose, negative things constantly about their suffering and that that's another thing that you see with people with mpd they, they're very negative minded they like to really dwell in this very morose space and what winds up happening because they're so self-involved in that is you always see them one thing that you usually see with narcissistic parents is they become neglectful and mm -hmm. howard no different you know we sit here and we call him the absentee father he was neglectful of his daughters more more than likely I mean, yeah. I don't know the intricacies of their relationship, but well, he was they he was the center of his own world. We had another clip again. I could play it, and I will play it at some point. Where he Robin goes on the wrap up show and explains how when they were in the Bronx, they they passed the Bronx and they had a potty in the trunk of their limo, and um, they had to change or uh, no, sorry, Emily. Yeah, the Emily's the oldest. Emily had to pee, so they got went to get the potty from the trunk in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Howard got so freaked out. Um, he locked some, them out. Some of, fan yelled, Howard, Howard. Yeah, that, 
that was it. And so he got of freaked saving out. his family. <laughs> he, like, so it was, uh, I think, Fred and Robin, or Gary and Robin, I think Fred and Robin and the kid outside with the potty, and Howard went back in the limo and locked the doors on them. I'm surprised he didn't snatch the fucking potty, too. And leave him <laughs> he like did that. say, well, I'm the most <laughs> important one. Well, yeah. they, 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 they laughed about it and Ralph. And so they, they all know, they all know this aspect of him. So at any rate, from that aforementioned documentary, narcissistic and abu- abuse and unspoken reality, uh, here's a clip explaining the roots of, uh, NPD. Is a highly traumatic, highly painful environment, usually uh, childhood. And it usually forms between two polarities where the child is being overtly abused and neglected, and then also being spoiled in some way that is also boundaryless. So you might have an abusive father and then an apologetic guilt written mother. Now, I don't believe I, we, we know from we know from his at least from the way people have explained it. And in the uh, the uh, history of Howard Stern, the Stearns were not physically abusive, which isn't the be all and end all of, of, of trauma. But it, mm-hmm. it certainly there's no documented explanation. I mean, I know I got smacked loads of times when I was a kid, but mostly with a wooden spoon. And um, it, it's it, it, the, the impression I got was Ben was just not present. He was working. Admittedly, he was working late nights. And then he, when he'd come home and he had the weekends with the kids. So they did see him. It was just regimented in such a way that he wasn't the daddy comes home at four or five and, you know, has dinner with the family. He, he was a late worker and he was the only breadwinner. Uh, and then and that the way um, and you can hear it more in Ray, the way she speaks. She's smarter than Howard. And he doesn't want to admit that she's more, um, what's the word? Uh, I guess she's more expressive. She's more, she seems more confident when she talks to him, she can take him out at the legs with a word if she needs to. And, but she may have been all about herself. That might be the, the aspect of it. It might've been, uh, they just didn't focus on him. Go ahead. It's it's the way that they abuse people, and she probably does know how to cut them off, and she probably did that very frequently when he was a oh, kid. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. they, they communicate through emotional abuse. Yes. They communicate through, so the thing, I think we're going to listen to it later when he threatens uh, Beth with abandonment. He doesn't come mm-hmm. out and say it, but they're emotionally minded. They're not logically minded people. That's why when he's, like his ex-wife or his mom wants to sit down with him, they start to go into logic. And they sit them down, they talk to them like a child because narcissistic people are emotionally minded. They, they drive off of emotions and they believe that their emotions are facts. They think that mm-hmm. that happens. So. Mm-hmm. so I'll play the rest of that clip. The father abuses and then the mother overcompensates for the child. Um, is that child then going to spend the rest of their life experiencing huge amounts of anxiety and depression? Yes. I... So the the idea the 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 idea that I was trying to drive at was he was provided for materially he never suffered in that way he certainly yeah. didn't suffer any fucking physical abuse from he, I mean he did he says he, it was a Polish uh, kid who punched him not a not a black kid as he spent decades mm-hmm. explaining how he was afraid of black people um, mm-hmm. but it's it, in this case um, it they they provided for him he said that there were um, Marie was afraid of his sister who he doesn't mention in his, hardly mentions in the private parts, the movie. He doesn't mention in the movie, she's written out, and in the book you barely hear about her. But yeah. he says that Ray was afraid of Ellen, and Ellen was very willful and very strong. So you had two different siblings completely, and he, for whatever reason, grew up extremely, extremely sensitive. Sam? Mm-hmm. It affects me in a way that I feel like there's a lot of NPD people in life that I don't think people realize that they are there in your lives. And this yeah. made me realize there are people that have this that I never realized what the hell is happening sometimes in my relationships with people in my life. And this opened my eyes up to a whole new way of thinking, I guess. I really did not know. Yeah. I knew what narcissism was. I knew kind of a little bit about what that entailed but until i read the material you sent and this stuff i had no idea and it right now when i'm watching this it makes me like feel some sort of way like oh my Mm. god it's eye-opening sorry bob you wanted to say 
Yeah, I just want, you know, I know that you guys have a comedy show and I'm trying to keep it as light as possible, but That's part okay. of the reason why I, I took this opportunity is because this isn't a well-known thing and it is a lot more prevalent than people realize. There is definitely a spectrum to it, but I'm trying to, I'm, I want to start writing and putting out more information just so that people do realize that there's there's a lot of people with NPD running around. And before you really realize someone with covert NPD has it, you're usually in pretty deep with them. Mm-hmm. So um, and they're like a slow poison. They're they they kind of pull you in. You don't really realize what's happening until sometimes years into a relationship. Well, I the one th- the reason why I wanted to bring up that whole the um the, the section of the Colford book in which people talk, decry him for being a fraud, basically. Do you, mm. th- th- there's a part of the aspect of this shy covert narcissism where it explains that um, um, a, sh- uh, a narcissist will have grandiose fantasies but will also be plagued by a feeling of unworthiness and thus shame for even having fantasized about his or her greatness. Do you think on some level, if he does have this, he must know that he is a fraud? On, mm. on every level that he's exactly. put this this false heterosexual thing which is now you know falling apart at the seams <laughs> and i mean this narrative and they uh i'm the greatest broadcaster i'm a movie star king of all media it's all crap it's all nonsense mm-hmm. so do you think at his at his core he knows he's not as good as he is without the people and he, regardless he, of the uh, i'm sorry guys we're going to jump all over the place with this one but the um because then this ties into a little bit the ease in which uh, Marcy Turk and David Allen were able to get their hooks in him because he's easily, um, I got, I've got a link. I'll find it. He, they're, they're open to suggestion. Uh, mm, apparently yeah, like he, yeah. the, the covert narcissist, as far as I can tell, the, the, you the, the, fantasy, the fantasy, the, the illusion, the, the false self, someone who's a con person, cause they are gullible. They'll recognize that. And, and sometimes they do get taken advantage of because someone knows this person's holding on to a, a, something that isn't tangible, isn't real, and I can feed into that and use it to control them because that's their drive. That that false self, the the maintaining narcissistic supply and the victim narrative, that is their lives. That that is their entire existence. So if someone can recognize that, they can take advantage of it easily. Mm-hmm. Well, Go ahead, Sam. Fillmore, you said, do you think that he's aware? of it type thing and that's why he knows he's a fraud so that's why hence all the bluster co- and right so that's why i feel he has never succeeded in television because that is a very different medium that requires much more honesty and uh v- viewers so mm-hmm. they're seeing you not just they're seeing you. They're not just hearing you. Yeah. So hence the sunglasses, the microphone in front of his face, anything to block some sort of visibility from being exposed for the fraud that he is, he will do. The wig, yeah. the scarf, the leather jacket. I mean, sure. honestly, so I think television didn't work out for him, not just because he's not that talented. Well, he's not, but also because in maintaining this mask requires so much that he cannot, he can't, he can't well, do uh, it. And he doesn't few, have the confidence to do it either. There's a few reasons for that. There's another, there's another couple of reasons for that as well. And one of them is a clip I'm going to play now, which is, um, uh, let's see if I can find it. It was, um, he loves, he loves the announcement more than he loves doing the work. And <laughs> that's because, okay, once again, we talk, we're going back to, he wants to avoid responsibility. Yeah. Um, it's a real short clip, so I'll just play that right now. You know, it's hard to say no. That's my biggest problem in life. And I don't know if other people have this problem to the extent that I do. I'm one of those guys who wants to grab everything. I just love, you know, like, I love the announcement. I don't like doing the work. I like the announcement. I go, yeah, to make yeah. it look like things are going on. You'd rather have just announcements. Yeah, I love announcements. <laughs> I, I like, like the idea that in the newspaper would say Howard Stern is shooting a movie with Barry Levinson just would, would make me shoot my load in my pants. The actual having to go make the movie and sit and bitch about what's not right in the script and all that other shit with all my bullshit integrity, uh, that sounds like a nuisance. What? 
<laughs> okay, go ahead, Sam, please. I just picture like one of those guys in a glass tank with money, like blowing up all around them and they're just grabbing shit like the sticky and, <laughs> you know, like yeah, I'm just sitting here grabbing money. That's all he really wants to do. That's the only thing he wants to grab. <laughs> Well, yeah, oh, the worst you want to do. So the part of that part of the same documentary um, with the the guy Sam Sam Vak Vaknin is his name. He's a he did he's a doctor in I think psychology now at this point. He did um, a few years in the clink in Israel for securities fraud, and mm-hmm. um, and 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 owns up to it. But he's basically mm-hmm. made he's made his bones now being an authority on NPD. And uh, I'm going to play this one clip where he talks about narcissistic supply. And part of that um, comes also, you can read it about it in the same private part section that we're talking about. He requires constant attention and ad- admiration. His radio team, his basic support system provides these for him. Um, so I'll go into that clip right now. Because she made her, I start. I'm a narcissist. So my main motivation is what is called narcissistic supply. Essentially attention. Narcissus supply is a fancy name for attention. I'm also getting money, but that's a secondary uh, consideration. Narcissistic supply, attention, is what I use to regulate my sense of self-worth. You see, my sense of self-worth, as opposed to uh, normal people or healthy people, fluctuates constantly. It's labile. Okay, Bob, you wanted to say? Yeah, well, I I wanted to just comment about the previous clip. I mean, what Howard was saying was he wants all the admiration for making a movie, but Mm -hmm. he doesn't want to work. And I think it's more so like what Sam's saying here. It's not money's part of it, but narcissistic supply is more to them than money is. Mm -hmm. It's a a better currency for them. So really that. Yeah. Well, uh, so. Because he, who was it that came in? I think it was with Wendy Williams. It was the infamous Wendy Williams clip where she came in the interview and she called him out for being a star fucker. And at one point she said, what do you like more, the the fame or the money? And he, well, almost without bl- blinking, he said, oh, uh, the money. You know, cause, and he goes, lying. the fame is important. You think he's lying? Because I, 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 to absolutely. me that sounded, like, that sounded like the truth because through money, through money, he he can pay for all the support system that he has the wife the be- or the beard um the limo service the security team the freedom to be away from you know cameras and stuff um and, and but but you there is definitely an aspect of him that clearly loves the celebrity so he can't be 100% honest he's not uh, being honest. i don't think he's being honest and there are grades of supply you know Vinny from the bronx that calls in and tells him i listen every day that does nothing for him cuz there's mm-hmm. there's to who you're getting supply from if he gets you know whoever uh jimmy fallon calling in and telling him he's a huge fan or whatever that's it that's another grade of supply and as he's getting older he's needing higher and higher grades of supply so bob so bob like breaking bad you know like howard needs math right (laughs) he yeah what is his what is his supply? Like, what now do you think he needs? Well, look at how severe it's got. I mean, you, you guys have talked about it a lot where he fantasizes about funerals. And he does, he goes to them, and that's like the ultimate narcissistic supply where you have a gathering and everybody in the room is completely fixated on you, even though you're not alive anymore. To him, I guarantee Howard fantasizes about his funeral frequently. It's funny and you probably- mentioned that. Go ahead. Because I'm um, funny you mentioned that, Bob. I'm sorry to cut you off because we're going to play a part of the Ed Bradley saga going to Ed Bradley's funeral um, mm-hmm. and how he was he was he being called out for it. But um, the, let's play the rest of this clip, this um, uh, Dr. Wagner's um, clip, and then we'll we'll try to get back onto that. It was up and down. And when it's down, it's very down. And so I need to regulate it. I need to stabilize it by having people telling me that I am as fantastic, as grandiose, as omniscient, as omnipotent, as brilliant and as perfect as I imagine myself to be. Or do you think that people have to compliment you because uh, because you do feel that you're superior, actually? I believe that you believe and, that. Yeah, yeah, so you... I believe so, that you believe that. Okay. However, it's completely irrelevant to me what you believe. 
that I love that aspect of it. That that, mm-hmm. that goes in line with what Benjamin called magic thinking, which mm-hmm. Howard has actually talked about. It's irrelevant what the other person's perspective or perception is. It's only important what the narcissist feels about anything at any given time. Bob. They, they see themselves through other people. So when you were asking me, do you think he knows he's a fraud? Does he? Yeah, he does know that he's a fraud. But what matters okay. to him is that you don't know that. Like he he believes that you believe that he isn't. It's exactly what the doctor just said here. Like it doesn't matter to him whether he is or he isn't. What matters to him is that you believe that he is that right. grand. The sleight of hand. So explain mm-hmm. how explain how he, in this sense, if he's a covert narcissist, would be diff uh, a covert NPD sufferer. How would he be different from the extrovert? Okay. Uh, the, the what's it? Uh, sorry, extrovert. Uh, oh. What's uh, ex- what's the other overt? Uh, overt. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Covert. Well, covert. And extrovert. Overt. Yeah. Covert and overt. So the people that have it have NPD, they actually oscillate in between those two. Okay. So when when normally with someone with with covert, when they're in a scenario where there's plausible deniability, like being on a fucking radio show or anything he says, he can say, "Oh, it's just for the show." His plausible deniability is through the roof. He can say anything. And mm-hmm. obviously, over the years, we've heard enough that we realize that's his real inner dialogue that's happening, um, or at least we we think that we know that. But when when they get in those those areas of plausible deniability, let's say they're drunk. Let's say there was a recent trauma and they, you know, someone in the family died. They know they can say whatever they want. Um, That's when you really start seeing more of the overt aspects come out where they're they're bragging and they're, you know, they're being over the top. And, you know, everyone said when he's on the mic, he's loud and he's this way. But when he's off of the mic, he's very quiet and doesn't say much because there's that I think there's that that plausible deniability that lets him sort of let that more extroverted narcissist come out. Mm hmm. Uh, so we were just discussing the difference between covert and overt narcissists. Um, and so you, you mentioned, Bob, that there were, there is some overlap and that it's not, it's not as so simple as to say pigeonhole. That's what he's, that's what Stern's like. Mm-hmm. It's more, more, more accurate to say that on any given day, he could waver, he could, he could vacillate between the two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, but, but your, your whole, your impression based on your years of listening and the clips we played and clips you've heard, et cetera, and things we're not going to hear because it would take too long that he fits more into the covert narcissistic personality disorder. Mm-hmm. One of the key things you mentioned was that, and I was fascinated, you said there's no cure, like they cannot be cured. I was just going to say that. So. Oh, hi, I'm Robin. Uh, (laughs) No, but I really have that written down in my notes. So I said, if you can't be cured, does the, and the therapist must know at this point, this is what he suffers from, unless Mm -hmm. you're a total rube. So is it a clear cash grab? Um, well, it, you, like I said, you know, you can go to therapy as much as you want. No no one's ever going to tell you to not go i mean no one's ever never going to turn no therapist is ever going to turn you away um it's un, not only is it not curable but it actually worsens as you get older and part of the reason why i started commenting more and more is because i i don't listen to any of his new shows but the clips all the clips i hear is through your guys podcast and it's just amazing at how severe it's become that he can't even really hide it at this point. Like Mm -hmm. it's on full display. The one thing that I do believe he does that his mother uses to manage it. And a big reason why he's been able to reach the levels he has is through, uh, is through meditation because if you are a regular practitioner of meditation, it will calm your central nervous system. It will increase blood flow to the brain, which will calm down excitatory neurotransmitters which are usually pretty high in people with npd Mm -hmm. so you can manage it um probably when he's talking to his therapist as much as he says he dreads it i'm sure he loves it um he probably it's just someone to listen to and give him more attention more narcissistic supply that's usually what happens when they go into therapy well, that leads us into the 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 well, the summary of that uh, docu- the document in the private parts book that I'll read, and it basically slams 
that's why I thought it was amazing he put it in because it completely debunks the therapy he does eventually choose, which is talk therapy, which is uh, an, uh, analysis. It says here, um, does Howard Stern need therapy? Yes, he is anxious, but not depressed. And I never found out, I never thought he was depressed. I'm going to play this one clip and then we'll continue that. It's about the bullshit story he said for years about I had a gun in my mouth uh, and I was depressed. So the clip is I had a gun in my mouth twice and I don't mean Ralph's cock. <laughs> Wonder, but and I've always for people who do think about how they get there because it just doesn't seem like like an option. Yeah, well, I know I wasn't that serious I, about. I it. I never did anything. I thought about it. Okay, so the two narcissists tell you they basically my my most my presumption was they loved each they loved themselves too much uh, to actually end their lives. They just they're just too full of narcissism to ever end it. And already even said that after he was off the show and said I never bought that you know, that he was suicidal. Yeah, go ahead, Sam. And even when you, when you're young and you find out about what suicide is, doesn't something in your head also say, oh, wow, people do that? I wonder what, almost like a curiosity of like, what do you think you would do type of thing once you find out the premise of this? Yeah, Not saying you're going to do this, but it kind of blows your mind a little when you discover what suicide is. So when these two are talking about, yeah, I thought about suicide. Of course, everyone has thought about suicide, <laughs> not literally killing themselves, but the but the premise of suicide. Sure. But it's also in, in, my, in my I don't know, Bob might beg to differ, but it would be more along the lines of, look, my depression is bigger than your depression. My therapy is better than your therapy. And even my suicide measuring suicide. You're dick measuring suicide. Yeah. Bob, any thoughts? Yeah. On this? I, again, it's it, part of their job is to maintain a victim narrative constantly through every aspect. And they probably do think about suicide, but it's probably closer in the vein of imagine how many people would grieve for me. Imagine how <laughs> much, imagine how much this would actually validate this thing that I've been talking about, you know, of my my endless <laughs> Exactly. I, I only got six people at my funeral. Wow. Okay, we'll play the rest. I, I, I'll tell I you. Put a gun in my mouth. Does that count? Did yes. you really? Yeah. Yes. No. You told me that story years ago. <laughs> Two times. But it wasn't loaded. Uh, that's yeah. the mo- that's the response. <laughs> laughter after laughter. you say put a gun in my mouth. <laughs> laughter <laughs> and in, not laughter and incredul uh, incredul incredul uh, like uh, incredulous um, comment. Oh, wait a second. So you I don't need think- the yucko horn after <laughs> that? I put a gun in my mouth. Huh? Uh, Honk. I thought Dad wasn't gonna really do it. Oh my god. Well, well my father did it when I was. I didn't really do it, Rob, and I I'm just trying to get uh, some high for AGT. Oh. <laughs> I like how this- <laughs> So so he's lied. He's he's talked said it, and then he just lied. In the same breath, almost in the same yeah. breath. But so, he also said he put a gun in his mouth when he talked to Artie. Remember? Oh yeah, that was that was an earlier clip. This was 2012. This clip. I just wanted to get the most recent one where he actually bullshitted about that. Um, the but the you talk about funerals. This is the one that I wanted to play. The Pittsburgh P calling in and giving him shit for missing Gary's father's wake. Yeah. So I got a lot of email people complaining. Oh, I'm sure. That, uh, why weren't you at Gary's father's <laughs> funeral? Oh, something went all the way back there. They went all the way. Here's a guy on the phone. Oh, hey, I Pete. saw that coming up six, seven, hey, Pete, you're on the air in Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah, he's, he's on the phone. He goes, why did you go to Ed Bradley's funeral, not Gary's father? Like, it was Ed a choice. Ed Bradley's more important. Yeah, no, so why would I? Who's Gary's father? <laughs> it was that? a choice, stupid. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay, I don't know. Hardly knew him. There wasn't anybody good there. <laughs> it is a big deal out to the fans. I don't give a shit what what fucking fans think. I, I, I dude, I told you. I first of all, Gary, I was never going to Gary's father's funeral. I was going to Gary's father's wake. So he's getting hung up on semantics first of all. But like the the the, the premise is still the same. Memorial funeral funeral service somewhere for someone who's been more important to you on some level than a guy that interviewed you for a couple days and that only showed 15 minutes of. Bob, you wanted to say because this tied this ties into that whole aspect of um, oh god, now I just he was on the tip of my tongue. Uh, please, what what did you want to say? Well, one one thing that you've said a couple of times now, where you're like, yeah, it's a technicality. Like that's what's interesting with these people is you're always they're almost like lawyers with language, and you're always on a contract with them that you never really realized you engaged in. Mm-hmm. And they they use language against you and they use language. They're very technical with how they speak and they're mm-hmm. very technical with your words as well. So when you see Beth 
and she seems panicked when he's talking to her and she's being very selective about her words it's mm-hmm. because she knows that he is like a lawyer examining every single word and even just the most subtle misplaced word can cause major repercussions and major mm-hmm. use later on so i just wanted to say that and I sorry also... sam sorry sam one sec if anybody wants to see clear visual and audio evidence Choose. Look at the aforementioned sixty minutes interview with Ed Bradley, and when Beth starts to go into that, that fucking well worn, well trod, trod on, like I'm gonna tell you the story of how we met Ed, and uh, and then Howard's looking over at her like, mm-hmm, okay, let's see if she got the script memorized. Mm-hmm. She's looking at him to see that she's getting the bullshit right. He's looking at her to make sure she doesn't fuck up. Yeah. And that he can control. Clearly, he's looking not as a means of pride or as a means of this is a funny story. He starts out like that, but he can't keep up the ruse. You can, you don't have to be a CIA body language analyst to know this when you see it. And I knew it then in 2005, and I know it now. There's just, there's no way that could fool me. Sam, you wanted to say, please. So this caller, if I'm correctly assessing him as an MPD person. The caller is criticizing him, and that immediately is criticizing the mask that he has. And now it's falling a little bit. So, what does he do? He is criticizing and yeah, he's attacking, mocking, he is and, a, and bullying. Right. He's he's not emotional. Right. So he's punishing. Is. He's punishing this person for even their opinion. Or do you know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. Anything by force, by abuse, it's always everything he does that seems like it's attacking that mask. It's 10 times worse than you. Why would yeah. he be so upset about this? Unless, Why would un- he unless, react in this way? Unless, unless the shell was that thin and that weak and that. Uh, and so you, you mentioned, Bob, part of the whole narcissist, the false self. It, the ego is so fragile mm-hmm. in the covert. I, that's what I really wanted to get at. Is does the co- covert NPD sufferer have a weaker sense of self than the extrovert? Uh, they have no sense of self. Oh, they're, I'm saying I'm the, I'm saying does their does their ego uh, like a, a pure narcissist? Mm. As far as to the best of my knowledge, they have no there. There's no way to to um, upset their ego because they're always right. You're, you're who's exactly bigger? Right. Who's better at holding on to the mask? You're I exactly suppose. Right. Yeah. And 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 overt just won't care. So right. an overt narcissist, if you come to him and you go, Bob or, or Howard or whoever, I think you're full of shit. I don't think you really did this. And an overt doesn't care what you think, and they're just going to walk away. Okay. Where a covert will la- either, A, they're going to lash out at you and become abusive, or B, they're going to internalize it, and they're going to f- make a project out of you. If, if you've really caused major damage to their to the false self and they'll get you back. I mean, eventually, one way or another, they're going to start thinking of a way to get you back, to humiliate you, to do something. So that would be the difference between those two. The, the more extroverted is just like he'll realize that he's lost your control and he's just going to walk away. Mm-hmm. Sam, do you think the Ben Stern clip of him? chastising him when he was a kid was like a covert narcissist plan all along where he now gets to bring Ben to justice on the airwaves by Definitely. making him an abusive father. Definitely. Cause even you got to understand, it doesn't matter. They're emotional thinkers and all Howard knows is that emotionally hurt me. Even though if you sat him down and you were like, Howard, you know, you were a kid, you didn't understand it. This cost you're, this amount of money. It, like you were on a schedule and you were being a sh- little shit, which they've yeah, said many being... times. He was an awful child. Like he was very annoying and whiny and hated mm-hmm. to do anything and wouldn't do his chores and useless. He was a useless tit. So they they fight dirty. I mean, they they'll they'll use that. They'll build a case against you. You they'll walk someone into a courtroom. The person doesn't even know what's going on. They'll have a whole case built against them. And you've seen that a lot with Howard, where he'll pull someone in a room and the person has no idea what's going on. And not right. only does he have a whole script written out and points written out, he's got witnesses. He's got callers to come in. And people, he just completely sandbags people. And I've seen that with a lot of NPD where they walk in, 
they're, they're victim will walk into something and they don't even realize they're going in it. it like, for example, when when you, you mentioned earlier, when Beth took that photo with uh, I, I Jared, forget, the guy Jared, from the mom caves. Yeah. And he, here before he gets her on the phone, he's got, you know, uh, Robin said this looked intimate. Gary, he went around the room. So he's basically soliciting witnesses and he was building a case against her. And then he had a caller come in. I would never, yep. by Take the way, I would next. never let some random fucking guy ever tee off on my wife or girlfriend like that. You know what I mean? Especially on mm-hmm. public airwaves. Like, that's horrifically abusive. Yeah. And even even then you heard her start to stammer and start. She's like, well, I'll, I'll be more aware of that. I'll be more like... She didn't have the boundaries that his other wife had when he would call his other wife. She'd go, I'm not fucking doing this right now. We'll yeah. talk about this later and hang up on him. Beth doesn't have those boundaries the way that the previous wife had them. Mm-hmm. So it seems like back to this phone call, this person is trying to bring him to some sort of justice about you should have went to Gary's father's wake versus Ed Bradley's funeral. And yeah. with this bringing to justice moment, he's met with abuse. Yeah. Right. And, and don't fool yourselves uh, for a lot of fans, a lot of fans, they ne- that was one of the first chinks in the armor where they realized this person is really an asshole. Because mm-hmm. for a lot of years, many people just believed it was a shtick that after the show, they all went out and had drinks or they all loved each other. Or it was just shtick. And he really loved Gary. And then as you start listening, as I do, and I've had to archive all these little bits and I put them on my channel and other people have done it too. Not just me. Todd Packer is one of the great guys that done it, used to do it. And uh, WMD, WDM. And uh, his compilations like the Artie Addiction Saga, you start to really get a picture of the person, regardless of whether he planned on outing himself gradually bit by bit or not. Mm -hmm. It happened. So Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to play the rest of the clip It's only about a minute and a half. And on my way there, my girlfriend broke her foot and I was in the emergency room all day. Can I make a point? You knew Ed Bradley for, what, three days? You knew Gary's father (laughs) for a long time. Hank the Dwarf, uh, continuous. Yeah, I got a Hank the Dwarf. Hank was, I think Hank. Hank the Dwarf, who contributed so much to that show, I don't know how many hours of content he provided and got maybe, what, free Bushmills or some shit. Uh, and uh, they were saying that when he died, Howard wouldn't go to that funeral either because it was in, I don't know, Missouri or somewhere. I don't remember where Hank was from, but he wouldn't go. I don't know that I, if I'm Howard, I would go either, but I would absolutely put money towards the funeral and not have them suffer. If I wasn't that the least, if I was a caring, thinking person, I would have done something for Hank's family for all the fucking shit he did. If, if Vern Troyer died for mini me from Austin Powers randomly during his height of popularity, he would have went to that. Seriously, it's all over Hank. It's <laughs> yeah. all about them. It's what they can gain. It's what yes. supply they can gain. It's what they can see. He would get nothing out of going to these, uh, out of out of Hank the Dwarf. And if he did do anything, believe me, you'd hear about it on the air immediately. You mean, you mean talking about, oh, look what a great thing I did. And, uh, oh, my God. Look like, yeah. You can yeah. see it with gift giving that you, you see a lot of that with with these people. They'll immediately tell you how much they spent on your thing. They'll tell you about the ills they went through to get it. And, you know, some some war story about getting the money over to somebody. It's almost like they ruin it for you before you even get <laughs> the gift. <laughs> Here's the price. tag. Let me show you my credit card statement before you open that gift. Exactly. I was in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I was flying in for it. No, I was in the city, and I I was invited by um, um, Ruth Streeter and the widow of Ed Bradley to come to this memorial service. I thought. What's her be... name, Howard? <laughs> uh, he did get. It. He did finally get it to see. Thought it'd be interesting to talk about, and also I liked Ed Bradley. I thought it would be interesting to talk about. I thought basically he wanted to hobnob with the celebs and the, the bitch of it is he got, that was my favorite part. The fact that he got shunted to the back with the scrubs and Gail King and Oprah were at the front and he quetched about it and he, he, he admitted it in the saga and it's on my channel that I know this is awful. I know this is awful, but he, he said, and that's, that's, I guess some kind of awareness, but he didn't stop from saying it. So hmm. he doesn't have any ounce of guilt. This, There's no this sense of slight you know. for him was more damning than talking about the slight. That's yeah. how he felt that slighting him during the funeral and putting him in the back of that church was more damning than actually discussing how pissed off he was about mm-hmm. being slighted, which yeah, is absolutely. incredibly narcissistic. Yeah. Also yes. true yeah. too. If you, 
all already, you know, all celebrities have some sort of narcissism, I'm sure. But already when he talks about going to Gary's father's wake, he, you know, was late, but he went and he went up to the coffin and he said a prayer. And I remember, I remember thinking when he was talking about that, how genuine it sounded and, and that he really meant it too. Like, yeah. He said you could believe, something. You could, be, you could believe already who's probably an agnostic at that point, but doing is like he, he told a story on, uh, I think it was Mark Maron, the What the Fuck podcast. And he said, his father said, uh, listen, go to church, go to communion. There's nothing up there. <laughs> just, just go through the bullshit for your mother's sake to please her. And he probably did the rest of his life. But at some on some level, he's also admitted that uh, I don't want to get left out of heaven on a technicality if there is, if there is um, the same reason. Um, if like, if there is a God, uh, Elvis had a, a star of David in his, um, in his, uh, in his garden, as well as a cross and whatever, whatever else he didn't want to offend. Think God. about, the, think about the fact that Artie was going through a complete drug addiction, alcoholism, everything yeah. also being on the road, having all these balls up in the air, but he still managed to make the time to go there and actually say something personal to the dead body of Gary's father. That well, is incredibly telling that somebody out of all of that chaos could manage to do that. But that dumb horse broke her foot or whatever, sprained her ankle. Who and st- fucking and still, knows? And still went to the polo match the next day. As right. if, you know, like there was no problem. I, someone said it was even that day. It was not. It was the next day, I believe. And mm. um, but the one clip that you just reminded me of, Sam, I'm surprised I forgot about this. But uh, at one point, uh, Howard talks up Har- Artie. He actually really gives him a, a high praise, I believe, for there was a union guy, like a longshoreman or whatever, came into the studio and uh, talked about how he'd love to go to a, a Yankees game with Artie. And this is off the air. And I believe he already said, the way he explained it, already said, why don't you come with me? I got season tickets. Why don't you come with me to the game? And he just literally like that did it. And he didn't do it for self-aggrandizement, clearly. He did it because he thought the guy would really appreciate it. Oh, if that doesn't show you the more empathy, right, he had empathy. And he was a guy, man of the people, making more money than the average person, obviously. But that's when when he lost Artie. That's the last vestige of sort of realness on the show, including mm-hmm. his drug addiction. So that's the heart. You lost the heart. Absolutely. So that's why you you said you stopped listening, uh, Bob. When would that have been? Would that have been when Artie left? Pretty pretty shortly after. Yeah, mm-hmm. maybe a year or two. I want to say, but yeah, mm-hmm. it was pretty pretty quick after he was off of there. Mm-hmm. Because that's that's a whole other thing we could get into in a subsequent episode about the uh, the dynamics within the uh, staff between Howard and the rest of the staff and certain yeah, incidents we'll, like the, like we'll the bro fight day. and what have you. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll yeah. play the rest of that clip and we'll try to keep going. Very much. And um, uh, I would have been at Gary's father's uh, wake or whatever the hell that is. Except, and I wouldn't have been at Ed. If Beth broke her foot on the way to Ed Bradley's, I would have Somehow gone to the hospital. She with kept her. herself upright yes. for Ed Bradley. Right. She didn't break her foot for Ed Bradley. She made sure not to go to the polo match the day before Ed Bradley. <laughs> it, it, you know what? Was she? It's a ridiculous <laughs> notion. She had to go to Gary's viewing. She broke. It's not like I wasn't going to Gary's father's viewing. I was I'd on my way it. there. I'd Okay, so <laughs> I love Artie. <laughs> yeah, these are always good for that. Now we talked earlier about. We wanted to talk a little about fear, the fear that uh, uh, the NPD sufferer might have. And those were two clips that I wanted to um, play. One of them was about. Um, uh, let's see if I got it right. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. I'm afraid one of them of was a about baseball. At a afraid game. of a baseball. <laughs> I think I got that one. But play this one about karate lessons, and Ray busts him on this. Then I was raised like a deal. I had no muscles. I just had, I was just a pulpy mess. Let me say My something. mother says, stop, I, 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 stop, stop, stop lifting weights. In her defense, would you tell me what happened when you took karate? Ah. All right, well, I, I, uh, I I'll stopped. tell you the true story of karate. He wanted mm. to, he came to us and he said, <laughs> All right, I ran out of time. take some karate lessons. Listen, you know something, Ma? Who wants I to hear this usual, again? We jumped to it. We <laughs> took him down on a Saturday to observe karate. Yes, yeah, so? He stood there 10 minutes, turned white as a sheet. He said, I'm not taking <laughs> That's not why I didn't oh, take him. Oh, that was. 
president. I didn't take him because I didn't know how to somersault. He says he never took me to a. <laughs> what an idiot child doesn't know how to somersault. <laughs> well, <laughs> he was just, uh, you know, what are you going to say? <laughs> he was uh, this, so afraid. <laughs> this is one clip I, I, I can't remember exactly. Uh, there, it, I just called it Drop City, and it was all about. Again, it, it ties in with this. I'm going to play it and see why. See if I can recall why I picked it. Anyway. I'm sorry, Fillmore. Can you not somersault? Can I somersault? Can I could do a cart. I, 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 when I was a kid, I could do cartwheels. That's about it. I, did, I couldn't somersault. Not everybody was uh, freaking. Not everybody was Bruce. Yeah, somersault's just like on the on the ground. Like it's not like a flip. It's like a forward roll. I think a forward roll. That's a somersault. Yeah. Then of course I could. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> I thought summer somersault is actually like you your feet leave the ground. No, like the, oh. no, you're not airborne for any length of time. No. None. Okay, well then, yeah, he really was just a, a useless prick. I would love to go to Bradley Cooper's movie premiere, and I said, "Honey, it's okay. <laughs> that's my rule. I just don't go out weeknights." She goes, "Okay," and I saw the look of disappointment because you know she wanted to do something fun, and you know me. It's no barrel You're laughs. So fun. Yeah, exactly. It's no barrel laughs being married to me. As you guys uh, quite uh, rightly p- pointed out yesterday, I don't listen to anything. I tune everyone out. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. It, 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 Howard brings this up a lot where he talks about how when you go out with me, I'm fucking miserable. I'm just, he's not lying. You know, like he's being, <laughs> he's being honest about that. These people wear people they're what what beth is which is probably his main source of supply they will wear you out with negativity you'll go in a place they'll start devaluing it just shitting on it they don't want to be like they will make they will make it miserable he's not yeah. he's not joking like they will it, they'll make it very unpleasant but um, then at the but then at the you know at the same spin time this, spin this coin around she when she does say you're miserable. I want to do this by myself. Then he did the thing where he goes, Artie, what are you doing tonight? Oh, you're leaving yeah, no, me. Oh, now I got to go out. Passive so aggression. there's no winning with no. this. There's no winning with them ever. You never yeah. went with them. Even when you've won, they'll say something that'll devalue the whole argument that you even had. You know, well, I pay your fucking salary, something like that, where it just overrides the whole argument you just had. They, you Fuck don't it. win with them. I, 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 yeah, absolutely. At one point, um, when they're talking about, um, they walked out of Gary. They he left Gary's party early, which is one of my favorite clips of all time. And on the wrap up show, Ralph calls calls in and says to Mary, well, "You what? What the fuck, you guys? Why are you apologizing for these two assholes who left your fucking party?" Ralph actually telling the truth for a minute. When uh, re, when Howard plays it the next day, he goes, "Fucking fucking cocksucker!" You know, c- comes in for a half hour a week, and you know, and then that gets paid full time for starts that. Starts devaluing Ralph. Right Absolutely. away when he tells and, and the truth. That's a perfect circular saw of attacking when he goes after everybody. He goes after uh, Artie for being late, goes after Robin for not showing up, goes after Gary. Like, you shouldn't have had the dinner at this time, Bob. They'll, they will get mad at you for them doing something wrong <laughs> and you acknowledging it. That's how <laughs> sensitive the false self is. Yeah. So, like, that's how extreme this this can get. Well, this is why in the documentary they said you have to not communicate with these people like yes. at all. You have to. There's yeah. no winning. Yeah. They Near can't. The end, they can't fix themselves. So you have to walk away. Right. So That's it. so so at that time. Right. So at the time of let's say for example, Allison and him getting a divorce. Mm-hmm. You figure you had to figure that by then she just knew it wasn't just a matter of her catching him cheating on her. She was just completely drained of of everything and said no this is we can't live the rest of our lives like this Mm -hmm. and she making a decision saying fuck it the kids will have to suffer through it and suffer they did i mean do you think she knew that he was an npd person because she was trained in psychology i I definitely think she knew because when she called in the last time and he was just berating her and indirectly screaming at the staff, but he was really communicating towards her when they went, she went to like a rock. The jingle ball. Jingle ball. Yeah. 
So you, if you listen to that, when she initially calls in and she knows what he's doing, the same thing that I just described earlier, where he's got a case against her, he's laid the groundwork out for everybody that's in the studio, so it's full-on attack of her. When she calls in, there's a method called gray rocking that they usually tell people to use uh, when communicating with someone with NPD, where you just give them no response at all. You don't get angry. You don't feed into it. And she kind of utilizes that method there where she she just sort of sets up a boundary with Howard. You had a chance to tell me not to do this. You didn't tell me not to do this. I don't want to talk about it. She calls back in. She says it to him again. And then throughout it, she just kind of laughs and and sort of cuts off communication until Mm -hmm. the call is over. And I just felt that it was very... Her whole approach to that was very clinical, um, just setting up the boundaries initially. And um, she didn't really feed into the whole thing. She didn't get emotional with it. And only someone who's had a lot of experience with them or a clinical background would probably know to communicate like that. So I definitely think she knew he had it. Yeah. Now that you say that, I I do remember her saying, like laughing like that, like laughing it off at the end. Yeah. And... You're right. Yeah, and his daughter even called him a narcissist in that Mm -hmm. interview. And I'm sure that she had talked with her mother and kind of her mom's probably given her the rundown on some of his... Did did, did the dates men successfully? (laughs) Well, yeah, well, that the the interview itself is that's the New York Daily... I think it was the Post. I think it was was pretty much the Post. Um, That, uh, yeah, she attributed the the growing up to narcissism, that everybody was looking at them and everything was out out to get them. And and there's loads of clips on the internet, folks, if you want to look at... uh, children of narcissistic parents and what they've had to go through in their lives. And, um, it's, it's actually pretty astoundingly scary. Um, yeah. and our, and our, our, my, my theory is that you started seeing Ashley, the youngest with Beth and Howard, and you only really saw her with them because the other two knew the score from Allison. They were old enough to be told the truth, whereas mm-hmm. Ashley was a little too young. And then when she finally got of age, the other two informed her and said, look, sis, this is the truth about your fucking father. And mm-hmm. they, they still love him because he g- helped give birth to them, but they don't, I don't believe there's any real love to him as a, as a parent. Uh, Probably I, 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 that's, a, that's a whole other uh, can of worms we'll get into, but well, let's finish the clip. Uh, I mean, you're right. I'm a disaster as a human being. I really am. Don't go too far. When he says this, isn't he reveling in the attention he's getting being a disaster as well? Isn't this feeding his own narcissism, talking about himself? I believe you know, just, it. Is. Yeah. People don't like me. So, no, um, don't go overboard. The only ones who like me are Robin and Jimmy Kimmel. So <laughs> I said to Jimmy, why do you like me? I said, uh, everyone else is turned off to me. And That's a good question. Why does Jimmy still like him? Uh, uh, childhood hero worship. Um, I, I've got to assume it's that. But uh, Jimmy has to know what he's about, uh, unless Jimmy's in, in, irretrievably stupid. Um, and I think it, it, the expression I always use is you don't know the damage the tornado is causing until you're outside the tornado. And right. When with or they call actually dark cloud, I believe, is that 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 negativity that an MPD sufferer has that there's all it's always bubbling under. And um, so if Jimmy keeps his um, his experiences with Howard short and away from his wife, most likely, um, then it's fine. But if he had to deal with him on a regular basis like Beth does, he'd have to have another residence. He'd have to be, you know, so now what we're seeing in the whole uh, COVID-19 situation, he and Beth are actually together for days and days and days at a time. Mm -hmm. They are forced, because they have no uh, home care workers, sorry, sorry, service staff, let's say, and maybe not even a driver, I have no idea, um, that you're seeing the cracks. Now when you're hearing the shows and you're hearing the stuff, you're hearing her using whatever weapons she has to get back at him in a subtle way. Maybe it's tripping on herself, Bob. Any idea? Any? Because you've heard some of the clips, and we're going to play some of the newer clips as well. It's not just a blast from the past, folks. A, a lot of their friendships are very superficial. Their their friends are only people that they can get stuff from, or um, they they don't really allow people to get close to them because the closer people that wind up getting close to them eventually see what they are and they almost always just get rid of them out of their you know out of their lives so i'm guessing whatever him and jim jimmy have 
um, is very superficial. You mm-hmm. know, I, I would doubt they're really meaningful friends on, on any, any real level. Well, yeah. since we're talking about Jimmy, should we bring up uh, the obit or the speech oh, he the, made at the Kobe thing? Yeah, that would okay, be I'm a just, good time for that. I'm going to play a little more of this and see what there is because I, I know I clipped it for it's a weird uh, length to clip it for a reason. So I just get he through said, it. Uh, I don't know. He goes, really? No one likes you? I go, yeah. I said, uh, I, 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 I go out with people and I never hear from them again. <laughs> 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 it's really not exactly true. I mean, no. you know, I do have friends. It has have a- he doesn't have friends. We've said this before. He has employees and we have a clip of him saying, I don't trust anybody. I don't pay. Mm-hmm. And it's such a sad life to live, to have mm-hmm. to pay people. <laughs> Do you guys ever see the Steve Martin film, uh, All of Me? Um, no. Where yeah. it's with him and Lily Tomlin. I think it's the last one he did with Carl Reiner, or maybe not, but 84 or so. And he, <laughs> she's such a bitch. She, there, she dies, her spirit goes into his body, and he has to sort of like fight with like, Sometimes she takes over his body, and he says something like, there's one thing you missed at your funeral, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you forgot to hire mourners. And that's uh-huh. exactly <laughs> what Wiggy's funeral is going to be like. A very yeah. small, like D- Johnny Carson, we talked about it. He died alone at a hospital bed. Nobody was around him. Not his sons, not his wife at the time. Not his friends, nobody, um, and that probably was not that was that was probably deliberate from them. It's probably like fuck him, and I, I some of it might have been I don't want people to see me this way, but I don't buy that. I think people just didn't like him in the end. Yeah, uh, uh, he got so insular, and Wiggy's the same way. He's going to go the mm-hmm. same way Howard Hughes did. Mm-hmm. Um, let's keep to continue with that, and then we're going to play the um, the Kobe thing, Sam. Mm-hmm. Because okay. I think that's a good illustration of their superficial friendship that he was talking about as well as his narcissism. Sure. (laughs) Yeah. It has happened a few times and and you know what? I don't blame people. I am no fun. I'm very introverted. I really, you know, a perfect me is sitting in my room. um, Like now I'm obsessed with studying tapes on photography and. And oh my God. Have you seen some of these photoshops? (laughs) One time he almost photoshopped an entire dog's leg off. In a <laughs> it looks ridiculous. It, it was, really, it, it, I mean, Beth it was schmo- looks, yeah, go ahead. She looks like a smooth, you know, rock, her face and just some <laughs> eyes. It's horrendous. Well, this more important, not a hobby. It's more important than that. Job more than important that. than that. More important than that, Sam, I'm sorry to cut you off, but really, really the key part of that aspect was also, that's another reason why I realized I clipped that one is because part of the, the, one of the aspects of NPD is, uh, being dilettantes with different, um, uh, in interests and not having any real interests and constantly going from fad to fad or hobby to hobby and not really yeah, focusing on any of them. That. Yeah. Cause he did, he did photography for about a year and then gave it up. You never hear about it anymore. Cycling, chess, uh, karate, uh, jogging. I don't know if he still does. Probably he still does, but they're, most of those things are all things he just fucking passes. He he lets them go in due time and you never hear about him again. So I guess it's indicative of that. Definitely. Yeah. Well, the photography thing, I do have to say, Beth said, I don't know if she was supposed to say, but his therapist suggested a hobby since they had nothing in common. And so they just <laughs> landed on photography. You can so feed my he started ego. started <laughs> taking pictures of her and it ended up always in a fight, the photography, and then it just disappeared. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. Like the way that they, they don't actually have interest in anything. Because <laughs> like, like they said in the, in the documentary, their lives are based around constantly getting supply. That's where all their energy goes. Mm-hmm. So when they get into something, quote unquote, it's almost like the way an alien would watch other people get into stuff. Like if someone's really into sports, they don't have to say, I got a sports tutor to teach me sports and I bought all these sports books and I got like you just you knew already like the Yankees because he knew players you knew different eras and like he didn't have to go and learn that that was just something that he knew so what what Howard does and a lot of people with MPD they just kind of make the decision I'm going to get into this like almost in a very impersonal way and they try to mimic what they see other people doing when they get into some kind of hobby but they have no real 
commitment to it. They have no genuine interest in it most of the time. And usually because it was coming from a, a non-committal place, they'll just drop it like photography, like chess, like mm-hmm. probably you'll stop hearing about Peloton. If oh, yes. Not paid by them. You'll hear it. You'll, you'll stop grilling. Hearing. When's <laughs> the last time that piece of shit grilled anything? <laughs> grilled eggplants. <laughs> Okay, Grilled so this, almonds. <laughs> that brings us. Thank you, thank you for doing that. Actually, Bob, it's a good segue. Um, the uh, doctor, uh, Doctor Sam, also talks about the wasting the the time he wastes on getting supply. So we'll play that. A functioning family with functional parents and so on and so forth. I think I would have been a delightful kid and and you know um, happy adult. I operate at ten percent of my capacity because I have to dedicate ninety percent to futile pursuits such as obtaining supply, such as coping with my rage, such as regulating my sense of self-worth, my ups and downs, such as coping with my mood disorders, with my lability. Uh, It's depleting to be me. It's depleting. It's energy consuming. And there's nothing left there for creativity, for for happiness, for interrelatedness, for uh, having a good time. Nothing is left there for this. Now, that dovetails into the clip where we're going to play just now about um, the r- narcissistic rage. So I'm going to play that real quick. And that was Are from the. Uh, yeah, go Are ahead. Are we not Tim? doing the Kobe one? We oh, we're, we're going to do that after. Yeah, I just wanted to tie them in together. Uh, narcissistic rage. Okay, here we go. I was, like, I was listening to the radio the other day, terrestrial radio, and I realized that they've almost created a whole technology to combat you, which is they have HD radio, right? Right. HD radio, the the only reason they're promoting that is because you've come over to satellite and are promoting satellite. So do you ever stop and think to yourself, uh, everything turns on your Like In other words, a a whole industry is reacting uh, to your one move. I don't think about that. But how could you not? I I see that as just more more horror. Like like I've got all these people against me, plotting against me. It makes (laughs) me even more paranoid. Now I have to plot against them. And that's that to me is is narcissism, obviously, because everything's about you. Right, but Gary's saying it is about me. But does that thanks, Artie? Like, what's an example of what the shrink says? Is it what like Gary just said? Does he reassure you? I'm in a narcissistic rage. Uh huh. That's one of the things. Does he ever try to say? Is he a fan? Not to get the details. No, doesn't know a thing about it. Now, this is a question, Bob, that I was just just off a little bit sort of on topic, on off topic. But do you think that it would have it would have benefited his shrink to actually listen to the show and then get his bullshit perspective? Or do you think if he if if Howard knew the show, he was listening to the show, he'd start acting for the shrink and you wouldn't get. That's a great question. Um, I don't know. What doctor wouldn't study his patient, though. If he was on the radio, if you were a doctor, wouldn't you look into what the hell your patient is doing on the radio if he is showing signs the way he probably was in therapy? I mean, what kind of person wouldn't? It, all depends. it it just depends on what their what their goals are. You know, I mean, when you go into therapy, like there there's an ultimate goal if it's just managing certain symptoms, if it's resolving other I don't really know what their relationship was, but what I can tell you is like, if you guys went into um, a psychiatrist, they wouldn't go, oh, Sam, you're just having a um, bipolar manic episode or film or you're having schizophrenic auditory hallucinations. You would only say someone's having narcissistic rage if you believe that they have narcissistic personality disorder. People don't casually have narcissistic rage, you know, mm-hmm. like he wouldn't have said that unless he believes that that is a major aspect, if not a personality, full blown personality disorder that he has. So Sam? since he said he had narcissistic rage, which means obviously this was discussed and talked about, mm-hmm. like you just said, what do you think that conversation entailed? Well, he, he's been diagnosed at this point, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was probably, they're probably going over the cycles that Howard goes through. And they're probably going through the mental cycles. And um, he's probably at least trying to explain to Howard why he's feeling a certain way about something. Whether or not they're trying to resolve that, I really don't know. I mean, that's that's what I'm guessing is happening in these sessions. I don't know what he's getting out of these sessions other than the, the psychiatrist is trying to give him 
tools and mechanisms to manage a personality disorder. That's what I think is going on in those sessions. Well, this is my key. This is the key because we're going to go back into that whole analysis of him. Uh, it says here, what kind of therapy would be suitable for him? Uh, certainly not psychoanalysis, during which he could lie on a couch for years, as Woody Allen has done, and be the sole center of attention. This would only increase his narcissistic, self-centered patterns. Instead, he needs an interactive relationship with a strong-minded specialist in personality disorders who could confront him easily and enable him to face criticism rather than avoid it. He also could learn to consider others' feelings and responses to his sometimes antisocial actions that involve patterns of ongoing conflict. He might want to avoid therapy, as people with self-defeating tendencies often do. He might incorrectly think that therapy will change the dramatic features of his personality that have contributed to his professional success for his whole career is built on speaking the unspeakable and showing the unshowable, but therapy does not change the entire person, only the underlying destructive characteristics. Um, so that, that I found fascinating. However, however, sorry, Sam, just one sec. The, the, the key there is of course, and you mentioned it yourself, if there's no treating him and he's going to an an analysis, he's going to analysis to just talk about himself is that the, that's the only benefit? He just gets to talk to the fucking shrink for endlessly about himself and then he feeds his own narcissism? Yes. It, you said they're, they're, un, they're incurable. There's no it, cure, so, right. right. So if there's no cure and he's saying, what kind of therapy? Certainly not psychoanalysis. Okay, fine, not psychoanalysis, but then what type of therapy would garner some sort of healing thing to this disorder? Mm-hmm. There really isn't any. There, so, there well, that's thing. comforting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and you think you think well, if Beth, you know, Beth was, uh, you know, she the, maybe the principal would drop some knowledge on her when he was dropping loads on her, uh, that he could tell her about uh, the fact that you're you're if you're stuck with a narcissist, you got to find a way out. Otherwise, you're just going to lose your own sense of self, and ultimately, you may even take on aspects of that personality to you know, to, to get by. This yeah. is one clip I want to play before the Kobe thing, which I, I didn't forget about. I wanted to, it, it explains how Robin also talked about setting goals and he said, he explains in the thing, I don't have a goal. And then he, he, he contradicts himself in another clip, but I won't play it. Howard. Hey. Okay. Hey, what does your psychiatrist say to you about uh, your idiosyncrasies of what, what bothers you? Because everything bothers me. He's already baffled by the word idiosyncrasies, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the way people eat, the way if someone's brushing their teeth around me that bothers me. Okay. The I'll way g- they talk, everything, every little thing bothers me. Let me go into the well, one I, minute. Okay. I just, I need to eat by myself. Right. Well, you, you've solved the problem. You're a loner. How, how long have you been going? To the shrink? Yeah. Over three years. He says over three years, and this clip is from May of 2003. So... Again, why not just tell them 97, 98? The first, the easiest way to say it is the year you started. Mm-hmm. So narcissistic personality disorders, I take it, don't have problems with lying. Not at all. It's just okay. another tool, right? Is, yeah. is any like sort of projected graduation day or does it just happen? I don't think so with me. I don't hear any talk of graduation day. not even day. close, huh? Not even close. And I, I'm, you know what? I've read about my type of personality, and uh, it's very frustrating for the psychiatrist. What is the type of personality? Are you borderline something? Or something? <laughs> no, I don't think there's anything border about it. There, no, there's something called borderline personality. I didn't know if that was you. What I you? am, um, uh... What did he once call me? <laughs> so here's so here's a question. We're going to go into the clip, but would he would he, number one is he trying to minimize his own diagnoses on the air to not appear as nuts as he really is? He wants he lies or or he'll only divulge information that is a lie. So mm-hmm. he he wants to keep the victim narrative going, but things that are truth like. Um, you know, how he'll never admit that he has money or what, you know, you guys have pointed out, it's no mansion, you know, his famous quote. Yeah. If he acknowledges the truth, he has to lose the victim mentality because people aren't really going to feel bad for someone that has three homes or, you know, he's just not going to give you, he's not going to give you the truth. I, I mm-hmm. don't think he would divulge that he has this personality disorder, but I've never heard this clip. So I mean, okay. I'd kill for a good computer chair right now. That's the only word I've ever heard. No, but, it, but there's a, you got to there's a something you're called. It's gay conversion therapy. You don't know what that is. I know I'm depressed and removed. Faggot. 
call that. <laughs> All right, because he, and usually they won't tell you what you are either. No, they that's, don't. That's a, a thing they do. But but uh, I know every once in a while I see some steam coming out of his head. <laughs> yeah, but how is that frustrating for the psychiatrist? It's frustrating because what happens is we go round and round in circles. Yeah. He starts to make a little progress with me, and then I go back to, I don't believe any of this. This is, you know, and I, I remove myself from the process. I, I well, distance myself. You understand, Artie, and part of the psychiatric process is to develop a relationship. Yes, and we can't seem to develop and one. And you see how Howard is at that. Oh, that's very telling. So we can't seem to develop a relationship, meaning every time the psychiatrist probably confronts him with what's actually happening, Howard puts the mask back on. Yeah, he defaults. He, he goes, he sets the reset button. It's kind of what I was saying. They they discuss these cycles, his thought cycles, just repetitive cycles over and over again. He even just acknowledged it there. Like, we keep going through these cycles and we're mm -hmm. not getting anywhere. And mm -hmm. that's why probably, too, when you said they seem to get worse over time, it's because most likely this guy's running out of steam. So if you've been doing these cycles for so long, how much how much bullshit can you listen to to the point where you're like there is no helping you but i still like this paycheck so Absolutely. i'm going to still try to do this so his cycles are probably getting worse because the therapist is one knowing he can't help him and getting mm -hmm. lazier and two howard is more set in his ways and more withdrawn selfish well i i kind of wonder if it's two it's a two-pronged thing number one the pay yeah the, the shrink clearly loves his yachts the way they are and uh but also that if it look if it's not me he's going to go to someone else mm -hmm. and why not me maybe i can help minimize the damage so he won't actually go completely postal because they're 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 i guess maybe therapy is some kind of anchor for howard because he's a creature of habit uh but at the same time if i were a shrink and I, i'd have to concede defeat and say oh, you're gonna have to find treatment elsewhere i can't help you because i i couldn't in all c good conscience try to treat someone who was untreatable and would take Wouldn't their this money be some kind of malpractice though then like well, you know in the sopranos at the end when dr melfi said you need behavioral therapy this is just stroking your ego and yeah. your narcissism for a sociopath, yeah. I can no longer treat you. I'm letting you go as a patient. You should be in behavioral mod therapy. Shouldn't this doctor, somebody say at this point, okay, obviously you're not doing any good here. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't this not good health, mental health well, practice? How do you, you know, how do you measure that? You know, like he, he's not a criminal. If he was continuing a criminal pattern, they would be more legally liable for sure. Um, again, I don't know what their end goal really is. And mm -hmm. Howard seems to think that it's helped him in some way. So if the if the end user is reporting good results, it's really all that the doctor has to go off of. Yeah. So and, and I'm sure he's used to getting a check and it's his job, you know, I mean, it's we're looking at it from a more ethical standpoint, but I'm sure he makes quite a bit. I mean, probably some pretty serious money with every session with Howard. So I think it's probably a mixture of all those things. Mm -hmm. Do you think any of it is conversion therapy? No, no. Okay. Bob, Bob's Bob, Bob is convinced he's not actually gay. And we probably have to go to that the next episode uh, because we're not going to have enough time. We'll play the rest of this clip and we'll play the, the, the more newer ones as well. Three years. <laughs> I can't develop a relationship. It's awkward and weird. I just don't want it. Well, here's my question. Here's my question. Yeah, I keep to... going because I recognize I have a problem. It goes to all of that. Yeah. How long is too long? Like, in other words, if you were doing this for 10 years, is that I don't, You know what? I've come to the... Oh, moment. add another 10 to that, Gary. Jesus. <laughs> as long as you want to go. Why would it be too long? Right. Where would the too long come from? In other in? words, like Woody Allen... You sound like my mother or no, something no. like that. Like, it's like... It's just something you like to do and you better yourself and maybe you do it your whole life. Maybe yeah. you don't. I mean, it's just I don't if you see progress and it's assistance to you in your life, why would you stop? Yeah, I, I see progress in, in, a, in a lot of aspects of my life, particularly with my kids and uh <laughs> he's basically he's going to a human tutor who's telling you this is how you <laughs> must react. This is you must smile when people do this. When your children hug you, you must raise your arms and embrace them. That kind of shit. It's like dat data from fucking Star Trek. Uh, also, next generation. Ray never said 
oh, go to it as long as you have to forever if you are le- Ray thought therapy was nonsense. Oh, you're going to complain about me? Like, right. that's Be- how she thought of it. She didn't think of it this way. Well, the, 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 the claim was she, she went into TM and she went, in, she went into it properly and it helped her. So he decided it might help him. But clearly it hasn't, really, because um, I, you, don't, you don't get the sense that if he ever has a, st- a stressful situation, a stressor comes in, he's not going to immediately go, I'm going to go to TM. It doesn't come to him. I would, it would, it would, if it was that effective, I'd, I'd turn to it in a, in a heartbeat. But anyway, I know he can't do it in the middle of a show, but still. Um, the way I, I deal with, with certain situations, I'm a little better because I'm, I'm insane. <laughs> see, I see progress as well. Yeah, see? I saw a lot of immediate progress, and I haven't seen, like, any sense. Oh, it slowed down for you. Uh, yeah, no, no. Oh, I because don't... I can't take you clearing no, your throat? No, 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 not just that. But, I mean, I think that you got to a point where you're better, and I, I don't even... Do you think I've gone as far as I'm going to go? I don't know that things are so bad now. Right. Well, right? with you, maybe in his mind. Yeah, right, that's mind, true. Yeah, in my mind, things, things aren't so wonderful. Things are so good, and he's just holding on. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. That, Robin's explanation would be more accurate. <laughs> it sounds like your shrink is going to develop a relationship with a new Gulfstream jet. Jeez. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, yeah, sure. I'm just trying to... If a dishwasher went to this shrink, would he be depressed and removed, or would he just have to get over it? Oh, look at you. I mean, you You're know... You're just hostile and angry. Absolutely, guys... because you went one day. Yeah. I was just thinking, it's, it's like if you, out. if you consider it like a doctor, right? Right. If you went to a doctor for 10 it's years... It's not like a doctor like when you go for a cold. It's like a doctor that uh, is trained, clinically trained, to do this stuff, and either you buy into it or you don't. And... But there are also many different reasons to go. You might have some crisis you just want to deal with and then that's short term right there might be a whole personality thing that may be long term yeah i i need it because whenever uh, as robin says these short-term crisis come up i go nuts i just uh hate it so i was i'm able to deal with him he's helped me a lot robin you were going for a long time a lot and then you just stopped how did you decide that you were going to stop because i did what i wanted to do that's that's not i true. ate a lot of baskin robins <laughs> And got as fat as I fucking wanted to. Well, she, her, her psychiatrist left the, like she retired. That was why she stopped. It wasn't any conscious. She said, she claims it was a conscious decision, but she, at the same time, she said, no, she was giving up. And Robin goes, what am I going to do without you? And she maintained a relationship. I hosed with my the, asshole off and as many driveways as I wanted to film more. She, <laughs> she basically uh, maintained a friendship with Dr. London, she called her. And uh, got probably called her for whenever she needed anything and got free diagnoses. But mm-hmm. she did not go. She did not really, really, according to Gary, she was more manageable, but she still wasn't cured. I got to a point that I wanted to be at that. Uh, I had a goal in mind. I don't know that Howard necessarily has that or I don't. maybe he does. I don't have I don't a goal. Know. I don't have a goal. All right. So I'm not even sure. Go. I'm not even sure why I'm there. But. Went- okay. So you get you get all kinds of mixed signals on this. I'm not going to play the rest yeah. of it because that's you, there you go. It's I'm not, not goal- even sure why I'm there. <laughs> it's not goal oriented therapy. It was just something he felt made him feel better about himself. So um, we, we wanted to play the Kobe Bryant clip, which was um, one of the more recent in February of 25th of this year when Kobe Bryant passed away and Jimmy Kimmel presided over his uh, his over his. He yeah. did some of the oration. And so Bob yeah, did you, a really great job about talking about this clip um, when we were messaging back and forth. So I'd really like Bob to take the lead on this clip because please, please do. Yeah. So you tell me where to stop. Okay. Where's Michael? Michael. Hi. Hey, what's up, Howard? Hey. Hey, you got to tell your boy to get his shit together. It's embarrassing him crying on like that. It's an underrated rule that at a black funeral, you can't be crying more than the widow. It's a fact. <laughs> Are you black? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm black, and it's embarrassing. So, uh, I mean, he, he needs to stop. He's got to stop now. Uh, you guys are being a little... I mean, I, I just don't think there's any more room for Jimmy to cry anymore at my How funeral. could he have more... T- <laughs> okay, that's part of it. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. No, I mean, he, he puts through a collar. You know, he knows he knows what the callers are going to say before he puts puts them through. So here he put he puts through a guy that just trashes him right off the bat, which is what Howard wanted to do, and now he's opened up this dialogue that he's mm-hmm. probably been stewing over and wanting to get to for some time. This is a part of that exhaustion, you know, mm-hmm. that, that 
Ann Vacken was talking about, he probably sat and dwelled on this aspect of Jimmy crying for a long time and was thinking about how he's going to, what he's going to say when it comes up, how he's going to get into it. Like this is, they're always kind of plotting for this kind of stuff. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tears, he he cried all of his tears out. I mean, when Jimmy was growing up, I entertained him on the radio. Well, I guess maybe he went to a lot of Kobe's games and he was in Vegas. I can only imagine. Yeah. um, Right. Painful this is for them. I watched this like live. Not one part of me was laughing. Not a single shred. Okay. I couldn't even imagine mocking this if I wanted to, even that your, soon. By your own admission, you were not like a Lakers fan, a basketball fan, or a Kobe fan. Could give a shit. Yeah, yeah. same. And it uh, was. It, now, never mind that Jimmy Kimmel is one of the like easiest criers on the planet. He'll cry over, you know, a, a lost dog, uh, as well as John Ritter's funeral or his passing. But I mean, you at some point you have to just at least say, "Look, the guy is in touch with his feelings," and I don't believe for a minute that these are crocodile tears on Kimmel's part. So it's a legit human reaction. He's a, he's emotional. Howard doesn't have that emotion. I don't think he has. And when you see in that uh, 60 Minutes thing where he actually starts weeping or welling up about how he's treated his employees, you don't buy it for a minute. You, it's, it looks like shit. It looks like, like the, okay, I'm supposed to cry on camera. Mm, hold on. Let me, convert, let me compose myself so I can get the tears up. And the teardropper comes out and whatever makes it look like he's, uh, he's got some emotion. I, know, I don't buy it. So it makes no, it's not surprising for me to hear him act like this. Any of us could have imagined this (laughs) everywhere you go (laughs) you see his face his number all right all right Gigi's face Gigi's number everywhere at every intersection there are hundreds of murals painted by artists who were in Beth and I were watching I said you think Jimmy has any tears left for me so there you go, Bob. You uh, teed, it teed, 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 it, teed it up for you, yeah. So, you know, I mean, first off, what, what grabbed me about that clip when you guys played it was how incredibly morbid it was that they were sort of laughing about it and mocking. I mean, that's fairly inhuman. <laughs> that's certainly antisocial. <laughs> um, the, the, <laughs> Clip, it, it, what, what fascinated me was it was so textbook NPD because here you have self-absorption, right? He's he's made it about himself immediately. Yeah. This giant grand event trauma that happened on an entire planet, he's made about himself. So here we have that first aspect. He's being passive aggressive. He's making fun of Jimmy. He's making mm-hmm. fun of the whole event. He's completely lacking empathy. Mm-hmm. He's being victimized because he feels that this is going to take away something from him. And then you see entitlement because why does Jimmy, why are you entitled to Jimmy giving you a speech at your funeral? Like that's something that should come, you know, someone should offer that. That should be a genuine thing. Like you're not entitled to have a Jimmy Kimmel speech at your funeral so it was just sort of interesting because it was like every aspect of NP. right like who the fuck thinks that like one, that <laughs> it was put right. in that one clip right there like if you could show that to somebody that's that's you know that deals with NPD, they would absolutely say that that has every single feature or right. major feature it's it's also meant to minimize kobe's importance to anything yeah, so it's, it's, it serves multiple purposes, but it's they, all ultimately to self-aggrandize his own. Exactly. It they, also they, goes they, further. Uh, if you keep playing, he says, because I was the best at radio. So don't you think my legacy is more important than Kobe's legacy? Because I was number one and Kobe was. Uh, well, you're, but he's playing basketball and you're talking. Yeah. I mean, uh, what is, is is it part of the same clip? I, I think it we I think it goes further, but I don't know exactly the timestamps. But basically, we got the point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's completely morbid, and it, it's strange because we've sort of followed Howard for so long, and we've seen this sort of gradual crumbling. It's almost like the the show Breaking Bad when you see the end 
before you see the episode, you're like, how the fuck did they get there? And so now when we're hearing this, because we've known Howard for so long, it's like not that shocking. But if you really look and you don't make excuses for for it being Howard and he's talking about what the fuck did he do? You know, there's a, there's a stadium of crying people. And he's mm-hmm. sitting this there, one what shocked the fuck me. Did he do? And, and supposedly a friend of his, Jimmy. Yeah. And yeah. he's minimizing it. I mean, someone who doesn't know Howard would look at that and say, this is completely morbid. It's so it really is. Yeah, it's it's insane. Well, do you remember the guys that remember the clip? I don't know if you heard it, Bob, but um, when he went to L.A. once and uh, at the time that Jimmy's uh, newborn son was undergoing heart surgery and mm. he, he went on the air and said, I want, I wanted to go, you know, I was in LA. I wanted to drop by Jimmy's and say, Hey, you fuck, where's my party? Mm. And, yeah, did, I, and, and you could hear the silence in the studio was deafening. No one was there thinking, wow, that's funny. No one laughed. No one forced laugh to make it look like, Oh, it's just a joke. They were probably even the, amongst themselves going, what kind of inhuman asshole would say that? Well, with a straight I, face. even, even more recently, I, I'm, don't think that we were going to play the clip, but when he was saying, why, why would you donate your money? Or it's, it'll be bad if I donate my money to charity because I don't get the accolades. And yes. again, yeah, no, it, was, it, was, it was just sort of silence of just like, man, are you fucking for real? Like, that was for Kirk weird. Douglas, and he passed away at the age of 100 and something, and he donated all of his money to charity because his kids are wealthy on their own accord so he Mm. said oh that's kind of terrible because then he doesn't get to see uh it's the first one he doesn't get to see where his money uh how he's been uh, applauded for giving all this money he doesn't get the accolades well i'll go you you think that his corpse cares (laughs) <laughs> I'll go you one further, and this was when Beth was making doing her first book. So, be, hear me out. Which you know, I wish she wouldn't write a book, honestly. Oh, stop! Uh, I really do. <laughs> I mean, I'm I not really. I mean, it doesn't do me much good. <laughs> <It> does- <laughs> okay, that's just the first six seconds. Doesn't do me much good. Her writing. For her a book. to write a book, a kid's right. book for charity. Yeah. By the no, way. I think I think this was oh my dog. This was the book on grooming dogs or taking care of them with that fucking uh, swimming pool anchor Bianca on the front cover. Doesn't do you much. Good. <laughs> Donating most of the pro or some of the profits to charity. And what the fuck would you do that for? Uh, I, it's a- <laughs> okay, that's his thoughts on charity. That is uh, that, that was as unfiltered as Howard gets. You never yeah. hear him when he doesn't stutter, when it comes out blurting like that. That's him being honest with everybody. I don't yeah. care what anybody says. That isn't a shtick. There was no joke in there. No. Yeah. That's really what he thinks. That's right. So one of the other uh, clips you wanted me to play was the uh, Plank uh, fella, the 62-year-old who did like eight hours planking. Yeah. Yeah. And what was what was the per- okay? I'll play it first, and you explain why you wanted to hear it. Yeah, he's uh, from the floor. It's a push-up position, and it said the guy trained like a couple hours a day. He did two thousand uh, push-ups, a thousand sit-ups, uh, this, that, and that, like a full-time job, you know. And the guy's sixty-two years old. He did a plank for eight hours and fifteen minutes, and I went, "That is unbelievable!" And the guy's ripped. Yeah, but he looked like he was going to die at the end of it. I know, and I did say to myself, like, well, if that guy's 62 and he could be doing that, I guess maybe I'm being a baby. But I'm telling you, I can't I can't do that shit. I got a full-time job. When I'm not here, I'm busy, you know, talking to the guys or working on stuff. Hey, it's, 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 I don't have time for that. Fuck it. Yeah, well, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I, I, I kind of remembered it differently. He still conveyed the same message, but... It was sort of like he he again makes it about himself, you know, and, and he just like completely devalued what that guy did because he just they never can have someone do something bigger than what, you know, they can do. And, and if if there's an area where he even admits I can never do that, like that's what I was saying. It's always lose with them. There's never a win. So like at the end. I don't have fucking time for that. Fuck him. <laughs> Fuck what he did. Like, it's just, right. it's so weird right. how even, even the most petty thing that has nothing to do with him, he still has to devalue it and shit on it. Yeah. Like, 
for example, for example, just recently the um, oh, the Ryan Seacrest comment that we did in the last breakdown where he said, look, he's working all these 19 jobs. I only got one job and I'm making more money. Right. He He's clearly upset that he doesn't have an in on those jobs and this yeah. is all he has left. Uh, there's there's no no f- hardcore fan would listen to that and think any differently, even if they were sycophants, uh, mm. unless they were again retarded. I'm sorry, sorry, Sam. Go ahead, please, Sam. You wanted to say. So the the skill of doing that, playing for that long, obviously that's a big accomplishment. But Wiggy doesn't have the time of the day because he's talking to the guys, so <laughs> that's why he can't do that. Right. Seriously? Okay. Yeah. So let's give him all the time in the world and see if he can come up with that plank position for eight hours. I highly doubt that's going to happen. You've I all mean, seen him walk. You've all seen him walking with those that with the, looking like a question mark. I don't think he could stand for eight hours, let alone plank for for one. Oh my but, god! Walking off the Ellen stage like a grandma with a <laughs> hip replacement. <laughs> give me a break. Well, he, the sixty-two-year-old was five years younger. Give him, give him some credit. Yeah, he, uh, Bob up the age too and I, and I think that was intentional to kind of like make an excuse I mean I don't want to over over analyze the clip I just thought like he could have just left it at that's really incredible that he yeah. did that but he like couldn't do that he had to take away from that like any great thing that he brings up with anybody that did something bigger than him he has to devalue it at Absolutely. the end no matter what. because their success invalidates his yeah, I thought I thought that's amazing that somebody could do that for that long. Honestly, that's incredible. Yeah. Not one thing in my head said, well, what am I too, doing that? I can't do this. I'm, I'm too busy to do that kind of <laughs> one, shit. So who cares? One yeah, of me thought that's that. what I'm saying. When, when we talk about self-absorption, I think a lot of people think of people who spend all day in the mirror or people like, you know, some of the more superficial stuff Howard does. When we talk about self-absorption, we're talking about they radically make everything about themselves. It doesn't matter how petty it is. So like you saying, I didn't once ever make that about myself or think could I do, I, I was just impressed by it. That's mm-hmm. sort of a typical healthy way of looking at something like that. They will make every single thing that goes on in the room, everything that's said, everything on a profound level is about them. They're like- yeah. That's self-absorbed. That's really what what I mean when I talk about self-absorption. So here's here's a forty second clip that I wanted to pull up based on we were talking about how he basically devalues women. Uh, he's devalued women his almost every step of the way, and um, the, it's a, I'll, I'll set up the clip. Basically, he was asked about where's Beth. She didn't make it out this weekend, and Stuttering John was still on the show. And there's an audible laugh. I I quoted this on the last podcast, so I wanted to play it. And people laugh because he goes, "She's working." And then near the end, he goes in this rant about you're you're worthless. I'm the one who gives you the money, you know. So, and this is when he was with Beth. This was like 2003. So, I don't think everyone should be allowed to have their. No, no. Why wasn't course. Beth there? Beth was working. Right, well, was, she was working. She would have been there. <laughs> she worked all the time. <laughs> my life. I like to be with a woman who works. I'll tell you why. I get respect for them. They got their own lives. You right? get respect for their work. Go he, fuck yourself. <laughs> he, it's such it's such bullshit. We've talked about this before. He doesn't. He wants to be needed. But he doesn't want to actually be required to do the work to be need. Like to do being needed is fine. Actually doing the work someone that's needed has to do. So in other words, like with Robin with her cancer, he wanted her to be helped. He just didn't want to actually help her. Yeah. I mean, yeah. probably wanted the credit. Yes. For, yeah. Yeah. And may probably made sure she credited him. All right. My wife's getting a paycheck now. I'm like ecstatic. Yeah. It gives you respect. So you don't feel, you know, women will go, I give and I give and I give. What do you give? I give you, I give you the air you breathe. What are you talking about? You give and you give and you give. You give nothing. Okay. So <laughs> did you ever hear okay, that one? Okay, as a woman, well, yes, I've heard that one and it still makes me. Vomit. Not even as a woman, as a person. Who are you to take credit for my work and feel some sort of, you feel empowered by the fact that I have a job? No, I feel empowered by my own job. Why are you taking credit for my work that that says something about you, Howard? Why does my well, job say anything about you? Well, not only that, this is completely, completely obliterates the statement he made earlier this year, which was 
that my 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 dream is like I, I love a girl who's hot and desperate, you know, and she can't make it in the business, and uh, you know, like oh, but you know, you it's okay, you can be my star, honey. Uh, Sam. Also, too, like, why wouldn't you say, yeah, she's at work. I love that she has a career that she cares about and loves. I love that she loves to work because it makes her feel good. I, I, well, I, you know well, what I because, mean? Like, wouldn't that be the normal response for somebody who cares about you? Sorry. It should be, except for yeah. the fact that he knows when he's saying this that he's providing her with the work. And that's where this is really coming from. He knows. I give you the air I breathe. Money. <laughs> the air you Money breathe. is the air you breathe. Okay. Right. Wow. Right. Uh, so there's that clip. And then um, the other clip, let's see if I can get it. Okay. Um, uh, no, uh, sorry, passive aggressive. Do you think that these aggressive... people with COVID are like breathing dollar bills on their ventilators like right now? Like that they need, you know, just constant influx of money in order to breathe to fill their lungs right now i'm just the wondering next, the next clip is called passive aggressive Masterclass, and it's from the yablo thing we've already played it but you wanted to uh get this one done uh bob so that uh you could give an illustration of the manipulative the manipulation they do subtly in the form of language um mm. even even if people aren't aware of it so i don't want i want to be with someone at night <laughs> you want someone there Right. But do you want someone fully there would be the question. I don't have an answer. Right. Or do you want someone who reminds you you're there? I want somebody to remind me that I'm there. Well, that's that's See, a that's little a more sickness. concerning. I'm a very sick therapist. <laughs> delightful. <laughs> delightful. Nonetheless. I have a lot of issues. So I'm working on my issues in therapy. And I know okay. that about yes. myself. And I. Bob, I know you want to say something, but see how he says, but a delightful. So like Keith Ablo has to stroke he's his ego like, while saying yeah. that that's concerning because he knows that's concerning. But he knows that he's right now uncovering a character that he didn't realize he was going to be encountering. When he asked him, so do you need her there to show you because you want her there to show you that you're there? That. Avalo knows the implications of how he answered that when he said, I need her there to show me that I'm there. He was like, I know in his mind, he was like, oh, shit. Like, I, <laughs> that, that's, that's extremely unhealthy. Again, because like what I'm saying is you, they see themselves through other people constantly. There, there is right. nothing there. There's no person there. They have to see and validate themselves through somebody else. So when Avalo asked him that, and you even hear him stop, he's like, oh, well, shit, that's pretty bad. You know, like. Hence, hence that clip earlier of Dr. Sam saying that narcissistic supply, that's, that's what they're, they're craving really like a junkies fix almost like a exactly. adulation. Exactly. So, By the way, the rest- Dr. Sam is not me. <laughs> yeah sorry. do say to beth she sure it's going to be hard for me when you go out but by all means you're a person you have your <laughs> needs and you need to go out you, you, and she's not asking me for permission i know yeah, i don't ask him but, for permission but i i feel the grudge when i is. that night that i'm leading up to leaving and then yeah go ahead go ahead go ahead bob Yes. So what they'll do, like, remember what I'm telling you, there always has to be plausible deniability. It's it's like they'll sucker punch you and then hide behind a bush so that you're like, oh, what? I didn't (laughs) see anybody, you know, like, so what what he's saying is I don't make her ask permission because that would be the most over way of showing control. But what he does is fucking probably gives her a nice jab right before she goes out so that she's guilty the whole time that she's out and he's going to run a guilt campaign that might last weeks when she gets even and she knows that yeah Yeah. years yeah i love this i love this explanation well yeah well the the diablo one like we realistically bob and i were talking about we could have replayed the ablo thing with him so with you so you could explain more about the nature the the uh, insidious nature of the whole uh, yeah. affliction uh so we'll keep playing that clip the next day, serious, you yeah. left I, me with my dinner all by myself i warmed I up my away. meatballs i'm like you, well i prepared the meatballs you, you inspire I emotionally guilt. i emotionally pull away from people he who leave me yeah that's right i do and then i think about that too when i'm out so i can't fully enjoy the experience Good. i mean that's <laughs> oh, terrible. Wonderful. Oh, that great. so again it's, it's emotional communication and abandonment and uh-huh. passive aggression. So he left her alone with her dinner. 
Like, look, I don't, I don't fucking need you. You could be gone. That's what he was telling her. Like he's okay. threatening her with abandonment. It's passive aggression. And that's how they communicate is through emotional abuse. And you can look at that again, plausible deniability. Someone could go, Oh, well, maybe he just didn't want to eat with you that night, but that's not what's going on there. He's giving her a punch. Well, you talked about this a little bit when we were messaging back and forth, this uh, discarding of people mm -hmm. and they want to stay in this idealized state. So yeah. not saying just this clip, but what state do you think Beth is in right now being quarantined <laughs> with in New Jersey? <laughs> she's, Sorry. she's definitely you know she does her best throughout this whole interview and even now to stay in the idealized state she, i think she even calls herself the ideal wife i mean like sure. flat out perfect. says it anything perfect she gives the right response i'm perfect for you i'm perfect for him robin <laughs> guaranteed there's some devaluement that's gone on because nobody's perfect like the idealized person, they can't live up to what Howard wants or what an MPD person wants. And the second that they stop not living up to that, that's when the devaluing starts to happen. And um, I'm sure they're in that state. Um, you know, you guys, I've heard that she's on medication. I don't really know. I think there's a lot of speculation, but mm -hmm. more than likely she is because I've seen it. At yeah, a I think she's high as a kite. Who wouldn't I've be? seen it. People need to be on alcohol, on drugs, just to be around them. Just to mm -hmm. because always on as you're always on a slippery slope. They're always being threatened. They're always being guilted. They got stuff being held over their head. Like imagine if the person that is in complete control of all your finances, your home, everything tells you the fucking air you breathe is there because they give it to you. Imagine the amount of anxiety that would put in you. Like yeah. you, you would constantly, your central nervous system would constantly be on edge because you never know what you did and what you didn't do. That's going to have repercussions. That, and that, that could lead into a whole discussion of what it's doing to her physically as a result of what's happening mentally, having to be around him all the time and how the distance she keeps normally might keep her sort of sane, sort of sane. Yeah. But now that they're together is the worst possible thing for her and for him. Because he's seeing imperfections. She is, is she, and she, she constantly is going like, oh God, what am I going to do with this? Because she knows, she knows full well. Uh, in 2007 with the Ablo thing, they're not married. They're engaged, but they're not married. Yeah. So yeah. she's still, you know, she doesn't have that guarantee just yet. The hook is not quite in yet. Um, but one thing you mentioned, Bob, in our conversation was, uh, well, when you were talking with Sam, was also something we discussed about how people often the the critics on the youtube channel for example was oh well, guys it's just a bit come on or whatever it's just a bit and you said no 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 it, it, and we both agreed you can't be a super fan you can't have it both ways you can't be just a bit and that you're just sucked in for 20 years because it's just fake it's just because that that's basically um providing a fallacious argument that you know, um, you're not hearing what you're hearing. Well, then what are you yeah. listening for? If there's nothing real, if there was nothing intrinsically interesting about the personalities or that you didn't believe them, you wouldn't listen for as long as you did. Right. Um, I mean, it's sort of how you get in deep with someone that has NPD. You, you sort of say, oh, that's just a weird little personality court. That's just a weird little thing. That's just a weird little bit. He's just joking. She's just joking. That, there is a point that most people who are victims of them reach that say something's wrong. There's too many things wrong on too many different levels. Nothing they do is normal. Like this isn't a little personality quirk. This isn't a little joke they were making. Mm -hmm. Like there is something wrong here. You know, there, there is a personality disorder. Like there's too many things that they're doing unusually and something doesn't feel right. That's how people start to investigate NPD 90% of the time. Um, so don't you think, though, that she's gotten to this point? I mean, she must have gotten to this point and thought to herself, especially now, more of the friends have dropped off and everything else. Don't you think mm -hmm. she is seeing this but doesn't know how to either handle it or she's a little bit narcissistic herself? Oh, yeah, I, th I think that's I think both of those things are going on. And I think that she's completely dependent on him financially. I mean, in every aspect of life, which she has sort of put herself in that situation. Um, but I think that 
she is at a point that she doesn't like him and she's letting him know that she doesn't like him and she's still playing the game because she's dependent on it and like yeah. She's just in a really messy situation, if, if I had to guess. Well, Bob, you mentioned um, that the he abu- he abused the audience as well. Yeah. I found that an interesting statement. In what way? Well, I, I just really noticed that a lot of people that used to like Howard, even you know, even Artie is a fan. Um, the way that they abuse people is they chronically lie, they gaslight. I don't know if you guys are familiar with what gaslighting is, but they'll, sure. they'll tell you yeah. something happened that didn't happen. Um, they discard you. I mean, he's, he openly says he doesn't care about his audience at this point. Mm-hmm. He's, ab- he's abandoned his core audience altogether. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you sort of look at those things and it's like, this is kind of what narcissistic abuse is. It's gaslighting, it's light, it's lying, it's abandonment, it's all these tactics that they use that he's more or less kind of used on his audience now. And they're, they're looking back and saying, this guy lied to me the whole time. Mm-hmm. This guy made me think things that weren't real. This guy, you know, it's like people sure. feel really pissed off about that. I've, I've kind of noticed like on, a, on another level than you know, normal relation because people had a relationship with Howard. They listened to him every day on the Mm -hmm. way to work. And, you know, that, that starts to become an integral part of your life. So. Mm -hmm. Hence why the strong reaction from X fans like us and, uh, and X super fans, not just fans, because unlike a lot of the people he has on the show, we used to listen religiously and, um, they, again, you can, you can, if you have a brain between your ears, you can, you can, kind of suss out the truth for yourself when you hear it uh mm-hmm. according to it, just information over the years that you've gleaned and you've collected and then you get an idea uh the next one is called passive aggressive Masterclass part two and, and one last clip i'm going to play is about him enabling already which is a whole other section of thing but it wouldn't but him basically admitting that he wanted already to get as fucked up as possible on the show sure <laughs> right. But does that make I, you? I, uh, I'm a very passionate man. <laughs> so he's winning. I only want to stay home because I'm the happiest when I'm. Do you know, also it's with clearly she... a reign of terror. <laughs> oh it's my a... god! Well, it... go ahead, Bob. I mean, again, she's playing into the the fantasy, the ideal. The I, I'm only happy when I'm there. She's saying literally exactly what he wants to hear. She's obviously Absolutely. not only happy when she's there. I mean, that's that's not reality for no. any relationship. So right. So it's a, you know you might be onto something. Maybe I'm the wrong might guy. Be. I'm not. I'm not Are you a good doing this for the show? No, but you, you know really what? serious saying that I'm the wrong guy. No, I mean I always felt <laughs> no. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, that's that's standard text, one textbook. That's, that's textbook. He's what he's saying is you're going off script. You better get the fuck back on script, or this shit can go real wrong real fast. Yeah, and we, we were saying, saying this during the episode. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We kept we and, we probably and, repeated it too many times. Go see, ahead, Bob. Look at how covert it is, because someone can look at that and go, well, maybe he's really starting to think maybe he's not the right guy. He's not thinking that. He's threatening her, which I think they, they acknowledge in the next clip. But, um, yeah, that's exactly what he's doing here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm bad. He's threatening you with abandonment. Yeah. He's saying, if you equalize yes, this relationship, that's what I'm doing. That's right. I may well pull out. Wow. See, that's, that's the right. problem yeah. right there. I know how to it's get like the people. As lo- and you're very good. That's subtle. Yeah. And thank you, Dr. Yeah, because it looks like... It subtle is another word for covert. Basically, yeah. 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 Doing is controlling everything and determining exactly how it's going to be. Are you saying yeah. how it's being Robin, passive I'll aggressive? It, I'll make it even, <laughs> even more, more incredible. What? I'm a hugely difficult person to live with. Hugely. And this is also from the same clip, and I want to play it just because he's trying to wrest control from the um, from the narrative. At I first guess- it did, I have to say. I used to be Howard's number one hobby. He's still my number one hobby. Um, hmm. Now chess is his number one hobby. But Go ahead, Sam. Don't you think, Fillmore and I said this during the episode, don't you think that's a really weird way to describe a relationship with somebody that you love? That I'm your number one hobby and you're my number one hobby. Well, she's placating to his ego. She knows she has to say the right thing, right? This is yeah. you know. the relationship with the narcissist is completely about them. They don't they don't actually view their partners as being autonomous, separate beings, or never you know, never equal. But yeah, people aren't supposed to be your hobby. Like 
<laughs> that's not a relationship. That, that's her saying, I will constantly give him narcissistic supply. I will constantly give him attention. I will be completely under his control is essentially what she's saying there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You were saying that you think that the audience, by the way, I'm going back to what you said before because it's sitting with me a little bit. You said that the audience felt betrayed so much because he was in our lives every day and we realized that he was an MPD person without even realizing it. So that's kind of why we've developed such a long term rage against him and almost, I guess you can categorize obsessive campaign into this. But for me, it's more like one day the light goes on and you realize, oh, my God, I've been had. But if you're time, listening to somebody every day, you yeah. really do. This stuff for me, it feels like I, I can't explain it, but it's just like I'm so glad that I found out that this is what he is. Mm -hmm. And we were duped in a way by somebody who does have narcissistic personality disorder well, yeah. and it makes yep. more sense to me now and i'm well, glad that we're doing this well ultimately though we wouldn't do this if we didn't f get it get enjoyment out of it and it's not enjoyment out of schadenfreude it was it's actually more we we find we find the fun in unearthing sort of truths mm -hmm. about and sort of peeling back the onion skin that's him and at the core of the onion there's nothingness it's empty and that's mm -hmm. howard that's the way i've always seen that's that's the way i've decided to look at him as an analogy so um so yeah you were saying that that's why the the sort of the the response from x fans is as vitriolic and strong as it is because they were so invested for decades even well yeah no yeah. one likes to be gaslit no one likes to be lied to no one likes sure. to be discarded no one likes to be you know frauded and um yeah i think that when people are looking back and those are sort of the themes that you guys really harp on and that he was making us think things happen that didn't happen he's lying sure. to us about this and about that and yep. sam what you talked about where you said one day a light bulb just went on and that's kind of what I was describing when people are under their abuse is one day they finally sit down, like I was saying, and say, something's wrong here. There's too many things that are off about too many things. Something's not right with this person. Yep. Uh, so it's sort of a similar process. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, this I've, I've often said this over the years, and I'll say it for the first time on our podcast, that had I listened to certain clips in real time, I never would have been a fan. Like when Scott Einziger left the last day he was in and he 20, for 20 minutes berated him about why wow. didn't you come up with this here? Why didn't you, you know, bring the idea to me? Stuttering John, especially the way they treated him on his way out, mm -hmm. I, would, I would not have been, become a fan. I would have seen through him and Robin and that horse shit. And at the time, because um, again, I had to listen retroactively and, and through like bit by bit and piece it all together afterwards. When you do, but the, you, most people wouldn't hear it. They might miss a show. So all of a sudden that gets lost in the ether, in the ether or either, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. And all of a sudden, um, you're left with this, this, this compilation of what the fuck that at the end of the day just angers you. It angers mm -hmm. you that you were taking, like you said, played for a fool, but then also makes such a colorful, like tapestry of horse shit that you can't help but look, look at it and go, wow, what's this do? What's, what do we, when we look at this, what's it doing? What's, what do we reveal? So yeah. let's play the rest of that clip and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap some yes, of this up. Is. No, you are my number one. Oh, but, no, but listen, Hey, let me ahead, make a, a therapeutic intervention. Yeah, you you here. stopped her before she answered. Yeah. You said no, <laughs> almost like she's six. No, I mean, you were like, no, that's Wait not right. You didn't say, tell me more. She can't I didn't tell realize... me what my number one obsession is. But she can uh, tell you what, what she I feels. Feel yes. Right. Your... Right, go ahead. Yeah. She please. feels like she's been replaced by, you know, kings and rooks. <laughs> okay. I mean, so wrong. I mean, <laughs> okay. So see yeah. how angry he gets, though, just yeah. from this omission of her saying that she might not feel like a number one hobby. Just right. because one little, one little criticism f befalls on his mm -hmm. lap, he just rages in this way mm -hmm. that's like, no. And he, and Abelo says, you know, well, wait a minute, she might have a point. And he won't even tolerate hearing anyone's point about it. Not no, one. Yeah. 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 Except that he might be holding back because he knows 
if he doesn't, then the the true the true self comes through. That might cause him even more harm because people are going to see him for what he really is. And you mean, regardless, they are they are anyway. So, Bob, he's panicked. I mean, yeah. you you can kind of hear he's off his rocker on a couple of these, and he's he's gathering himself because he's like uh, the the real person starting to come out a little bit. Like I've got to step back and. Yeah, she, he completely changes the narrative in her mind and tells her, no, I'm your number one. And that's that's kind of along the lines of gaslighting. Um, but yeah, that's the narcissistic rage. That's the rocking the illusion. It's it's met with, with some real anger mm-hmm. most of the time. And this is, I, I hate to end on this one in a way because we it, it's more, it deals more with the, the, the peripheral crew. But uh, when I heard this clip originally, um, I was really shocked that he... It never got more play than it did because of what happened to Artie later on. But at this point, he he talks to him about his addictions. I uh, forget. I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> what? No, 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 no. no. I, 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 I somebody think you know we've taken all. we've taken your weaknesses and made them tremendously entertaining. <laughs> the more drunk and the more drug addicted you get, oh come on, the more fun it is for our show. But they ain't putting up with that in Hollywood. Drug, that behavior. You addiction. you crawl up at a bull and don't start showing up. They they'll throw you out of that business so, so I'm quick. supposed to go back on blow now. Well, we'll see. You go out there, you probably will. He's saying if you do it, just do it when you're on this show. No one else. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so th- when you consider the, the arc of Artie on that show, and then you'd throw that in, and that's early Artie days, you don't think that sticks in Artie's fucking head? Like for the rest of his life, and I'm not, I'm not absolving all those assholes that say, oh, you know, he's a grown man, he knew to. We're not denying that Artie was responsible for his own addiction, but you have a culpability in the sense that if you're his employer and you're putting up with it, you join the list of enablers, which includes his mother, his sister, his buddies, his dealer, his uh, coworkers, whoever. That don't just literally draw a line in the sand, say, look, I'm not having anything to do with you. Is the same as an intervention. You you keep using. I don't want to have anything to do with you. You have to set a line. I never heard that before. No, yeah. I know a lot of people. A lot of people haven't. And uh, I I threw it in a few themes over the years at the other place, and it just got talked over because what else? What else is new? But um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's um, it, it's more along the lines of uh, with the next thing we'll deal with with Bob in, in terms of his interpersonal relationships and how destructive they are, and how also they feed that narcissism. In the within the studio system, so yeah. Uh, well, but, uh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Sam. When he's saying that, he knows how much he means to Artie. He knows he looks at him as like this force in his life, even before he was on the show. So to say that, knowing you're an addict, once you're an addict, it's not a choice anymore. Yeah, you're choosing sobriety and everything else, but you know, it's a slippery slope. To mm-hmm. put that in his head. Mm -hmm. That if you are more fucked up, it's better for me. And the way he idolizes Howard, that is like putting that is like putting that in his head in a way that will, of course, derail him. That's well, planting that, something in his head that's saying, I should get fucked up. It's better for the show. I should get fucked up. It's better for the show. Right. right? And I don't, I, uh, and before, before Bob says what he's got to say, I do want to throw this in, please. Sorry, Bob. Um, no. The, um, the, an, an arty analysis would be a much shorter show in a lot of ways. You'd, you'd be more clip heavy because Artie's not that complex a, a person as, as opposed to Howard, because mm-hmm. uh, we could, we could figure out his issues, you know, pretty, pretty succinctly. However, um, in this particular case, yes, uh, it's, it's, um, you're right. It's like a hero worship thing. And to tattoo that into his, his engrams and say of his mind and say like, look, this is what you're good at. Like stay addicted, stay that. I think on some psychological level that absolutely stayed with Artie the whole way through. I got to be Chris Farley. I got to be Belushi, uh, coked up, whatever, not coke, then some other thing drunk. And so he would, he sort of bought into it and, and Norm was not stupid enough to fall for it either. He, he said out right on the Adam Carolla show, of course they're enabling him, they're using him. And I hate the way they're they're treating him like he's Beetlejuice on that show, and he's funnier than that. So, and Howard certainly didn't like that. We'll play that in another clip, in another uh, podcast episode. Bob, you wanted to say something? Well, sort of the the message that I got from that again was he was saying, "Look, if you hang around here, 
you you need to stay with me. Don't leave me. Like, I'll let you do drugs. I'll let you get fucked up. If you go out there in the big, wide world, they're not going to take this shit. You're going to be left in the cold. So stay with me. Don't abandon me. Like, stay wow. here. I'll let you do all that kind of shit. That's that's what I gathered from that. Oh, wow. That's incredible. And you're right. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, you're right. That's uh, how they he, communicate. They you're won't right. put up with this shit in Hollywood. But we will. <laughs> he's, he's he's putting fear. It's almost like you hear about these stories when the uh, kids will be confined to their house and their parents will tell them, if you go outside, there's, you know, demons will get kidnapped, whatever, you know, really controlling parents. Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of what he was telling Artie there was like trying to put some fear in him, trying paint a picture of loss and wanting him to stay close to, to him and don't abandon me, you know, kind of. Right. That's what I got from that. And it, 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 it goes into later years when he wants to do beer league and he tells him how important he is to the show, which is really mm -hmm. more, we were crutching on you on the show. I don't want you to go do that. I don't want you to uh, get autonomy. And we've discussed it as well on this show, but that will be the subject of the next episode we do, which will include just interpersonal relationships and how they've been affected over the years and how he has, you know, been passive aggressively much of a, an asshole as he is to all the people, including Fred. Robin, especially there's loads and loads of stuff. So, uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad. Thank you so much, Bob, for agreeing to do this. And, uh, we hope you enjoyed it as well. And yeah, there's uh, going to, there's going to be a part two because at, at least this a part is two. just, yeah, this is just discussing and getting into the beginning of this. I, we will get into the relationships and yeah. how it's affected and how they are after the relationship ceases to exist. Also, I Absolutely. think it's important to mention. Oh, Oh, yes, especially all the broken connections over the years and the people he's discarded, because that's a huge mm -hmm. part of the uh, the cycle, as you said. Yeah. Um, and also, I remember initially, Bob, you mentioned you wanted to basically uh, you do this episode to help promote the uh, awareness of mm -hmm. NPD. And I hope we've done that somewhat to your liking. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that that's been accomplished. And uh, hopefully, if someone's out there and they hear this and something resonates with them, there's a lot of resources online to kind of learn how to deal with it and you know hopefully um it resonated with someone and they look into it yeah as well as sufferers of, of the not so sufferers but the people who are abused narcissists yeah. uh, by by npd uh afflicted people so mm -hmm. is there anything you guys wanted to say before we signed off i'm, I'm, I'm good then. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, this is going to be the first episode you hear this week coming up. Uh, also this week, we're going to be doing a new episode, our second episode of Radio Karate, which should drop probably midweek if all things go well. Um, and then uh, immediately after that, we're going, to show, we're going to play our breakdown after Sam and I recorded this weekend of the last week of uh, April, uh, the, the latest one. Yeah, yeah the latest round. The latest round of April Fools, and um, uh, we'll get that through you too. So three episodes in about a week's time, guys, and I hope you enjoy it. So on behalf of uh, myself and Sam, well, thank you so much, Bob, for appearing, and we'll hope to get you on the next one. So, uh, so take care, guys, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys. Bye.